Hello, and welcome to Legal Bites. If you're new here, my name is Alita. I'm a lawyer licensed in California and DC, and on this channel, we explain the law one bite at a time. We don't give legal advice, but we do talk about how the law works and try to look into our crystal ball to see how things might turn out. If you're enjoying this on YouTube, we'd love it if you could like the video, subscribe to the channel, share it with friends, all the great YouTube-y stuff. And if you want to listen while out and about, we're now offering our live streams in podcast form where you can leave a rating and review. Links are in the description below, as well as to our clips channel, where you can find some of the best clips taken from our live streams. Otherwise, if you want to catch me elsewhere, you can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And if you want to support the channel, you can do so on Locals, Patreon, or by becoming a YouTube member, or by buying some really awesome Legal Bites merch. Again, all links are in the description below. And with that said, let's get into it. All right, you guys, let's get into it. We This is the afternoon session for day six of New Mexico versus Hannah Gutierrez-Reed. Um, if you did not join us in the morning, we saw the state's um, armorer expert. He was an expert witness. He's he's a longtime armorer in the industry, and so he, he was an expert in firearm safety. That was a very big witness for the state, damaging, very damaging for the defense. Cross-examination was all but ineffective, in my opinion. Um, and then we saw the clueless producer <laughs> who basically was brought in pretty much just to call into question Hannah Gutierrez Reed's honesty when she is, in fact, on the record. Um, definitely that was a move to try to get ahead of Hannah Gutierrez Reed if she does decide to testify. This is a statement as to her dishonesty, um, but it is also relevant to this particular case because she had, I, I guess, testified to an OSHA hearing that uh, she had made complaints to this producer, uh, one, him and, and another one, about not just her hours, that she needed more hours as an armorer to properly do her job, but that she also uh, complained about Alec Baldwin needing cross draw training and refusing it. He basically on the stand said, I don't recall ever have, hearing her say that. So, um, and then the cross-examination was meh, eh, basically ineffective. So anyway, this is where we are. And we are going to just jump right back into more testimony here. John O'Rourke, did Legal Bites get a lunch or a break? Is she back already? I am back already. And uh, yes, I did manage to have some food some sustenance. Um, and I am ready to go. So let's let's jump into it, shall we? As always, I am going to be saving questions that folks have in the chat. If there are some that need to be answered like like right away because it's like relevant to the testimony, I'll I'll pause and and uh and answer those while I can. I apologize in advance if there are some that I miss. I try to get every single one that I can uh, while not interrupting the the flow too too much. Okay. <laughs> but if it's questions like this, I may ignore them. <laughs> no offense. <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Who 8675309. All right. <laughs> Let's go, guys. Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Uh, the state calls Nathan Quinlan. All right. Nathan, I didn't hear his last name. I hope they ask him to spell it. Another producer. He's got that producer vibe. I didn't hear the. I didn't take down the names of all the other producers. I kind of just ignored that <laughs> detail. I don't know if I ignored it, but I, I didn't capture it. I should say. Do you swear or affirm under penalty of law that the testimony you'll give in this case will be the truth, the whole truth? Yeah, he he's got a producer bro vibe. Thank you. Have a seat. Talk into the microphone. Good afternoon. Would you please state your name for the record and spell your last name, please? Nathan Klinger, K-L-I-N-G-H-E-R. Thank you. Um, Mr. Klinger, were you involved in the rest of the movie? Yes. And in what capacity? I was one of the producers. All right. And as a producer, what were, you, what were your job responsibilities particularly? My primary job responsibility was helping to close and raise all the financing and then confirming that the movie got finished. Okay. So even though you were involved mainly in financing, were you on the set every day or almost every day? 
Yeah, I would say almost every day or for some capacity of time. Okay, thank you. Um, the main reason we've asked you here today is because the defendant, Ms. Gutierrez, testified at this a is going to be another one of those that she had spoke to two producers, one named Ryan and one named Nathan, that she had asked you all for additional training time with Mr. Baldwin. Do you recall any conversation like that with the defendant? I don't re recollect that conversation, and I feel confident I would. Okay. So if you if she had approached you with this conversation, you believe you would that's something you would remember. Yeah, correct? I do. I believe that. Yeah. All right. Um, did you have very many conversations with the defendant on the set? No, at all? no, very few. I don't recollect many conversations at all. Great. Um, that's it. Pass the witness. <laughs> of course. Mr. Klinger, um, I believe I heard you say that that your primary role as producer was financing, right? Correct. Um, does financing involve uh, gathering investors to contribute money for the the funding of the film? Yes. Okay. And so, in order to be an investor for the funding of the film, do you have to be accredited, like have a certain net worth? No. Um, can anyone be an investor for the film? Yeah, if you invest. Okay. Um, is there a threshold amount that you would require, in other words, to be an investor of the film? No. So I can invest in in the in a film for a hundred dollars. Yes, but yes, you could theoretically. But, but what? That would be a lot of legal work for a very small investment. Okay. So is it fair to say you're looking for big investments, right? I would say so. Um, and do you know, uh, do you have any knowledge of um, of uh, Rust's, if, if any of the Rust's costs were returned um, or the amount, how much of Rust's costs were actually returned by New Mexico tax credits for filming here? Not directly, I don't believe. Are you aware of any of Rust's costs being um, uh, returned? Should have given a better credit? foundation for that. What do you mean by returned? I, I guess I mean by being able to claim costs as um, a tax credit. Uh, yeah, a percent of the budget would be a tax credit. Do you know uh, what percent of the budget is a tax credit? Not directly. My assumption is somewhere between 20 and 25%. All right. Um, who, who would be responsible for determining the actual budget? And what I'm looking for is basically what was in each envelope for various things to film. Oh, that's a terrible cross uh, question. Yeah, the line producer, I would. Believe. I just, I, I, I wish that she was going like breaking down these questions into very small questions and just going through bit by bit. And so that he's just saying yes or no. That's that's the only way to get through a witness like this because he, he's going to probably have a lot of, I don't really know, that wasn't my job, that was outside the scope of my duties. There's going to be a bit of that. And so these long questions that are like where she's kind of like sort of, it sounds like she's formulating them almost on the fly or she's trying to word them on the fly. Like it's, it's, it's an easy way to lose the focus of not just the witness, but also the jury while she's, while she's questioning here. I believe. And who is the line producer? Uh, Gabrielle Pickle. Right. Um, does the line producer also collaborate with the production team on budget issues? Uh, yes. Uh, so as a producer, do you have any oversight over the budget? Uh, yes. Uh, do you know what funds were set aside for the armor in the budget? No. As a producer, do you consider yourself responsible for ensuring there were sufficient funds available for, let's say, below the line workers to have a safe production? I didn't build the budget, so I wouldn't have knowledge of directly what was allocated to what. Okay, so you don't consider yourself responsible for that part? No. Do you recall any safety issues on set? 
Um, I recall uh, when Lane Looper quit, he flagged some safety issues. Okay. And Lane Looper actually um, sent an email, did he not? Yes. Uh, and was that email a day before the, the shooting death of Ms. Hutchins? Yes. And in re as the producer, did you do anything um, in response to that? I confirmed the necessary day-to-day uh, -day production staff who oversaw the set were on that email and yeah, I made sure that they were aware of it, yeah. Okay, and when you say the necessary production staff, uh, who are you referring to? Uh, Gabrielle Pickle and Ro Walters. Okay, uh, did you do anything to a lot more armor days to the budget? No. Did you, were you aware of um, an accidental discharge that occurred on set? I don't believe so. And you were, were you there on location on the day of the shooting? Not directly on location, no, at base camp. Okay, is base camp actually there on the location of the... It's on the ranch, but it, it was quite a ways from the actual location. All right. Um, were you aware if on that day that there was an attorney representing the production company there on set? I, not directly, because she, to my knowledge, she wasn't representing the production company. Okay. So, so you are aware of an attorney there, right? Yes. Do you know who she was representing? No. Um, after you became aware of the shooting, uh, did you actually head up to the church? Yes. And did you do anything when you went up there? Um, I remember I helped carry some pews so the ambulance could drive in. Okay. Did you help carry those pews out of the church where the shooting had occurred? No, they were already outside of the church. I just helped move them out of the way of the, the sort of entrance to the church. Okay. Um, and the producers, how many producers were there actually? I believe there were six. There were six. Um, can, do you know, uh, there's, are there two producers by the name of Ryan? Yes. Okay. Uh, what are their last, last names? Uh, one was Ryan Smith and one was Ryan Winterstar. Okay. Now you, you said that you were there, I believe on the, the day of the shooting, you told us your role. Are you? No. Just a minute, Your Honor. I was a little bit of a skip in the, okay, that's it. Uh, Mountain Princess 207, thank you so much for gifting five Legal Bites memberships. MYH10, right, I'm going to pause real quick. Uh, MYH10, Dave Beatty, Nicole has ADHD, Hockey, Ma Hockey Mama 39, Jill Sturgis, you've all been gifted memberships by Mountain Princess 207. Very kind and generous of you, Mountain Princess. Um, and to all you folks uh, who've been gifted one, welcome or welcome back to Bike Club. Very happy to have you guys here. Are you the only producer with the first name, Nathan? Yes. Thank you. Yeah, they, they didn't need to do an extensive redirect at all because that cross was not very... So what she's trying to get out on cross-examination here is... Hang on one second. What she's trying to get out on cross-examination here is, is she's trying to get to the, the budget allocation towards safety versus other stuff. So like the fact that there were, you know, six producers there, who knows how much they were getting paid for, for being producers, but only one armor and, she, and oh, she's part-time. So what, she, what she's trying to get at is, is there the concern of the producers with making money as opposed to allocating a proper proper percentage of of money to safety concerns and safety issues and preventing safety issues. So that's what she's really trying to go out with these producers. The problem is they're testifying that they 
didn't have anything to do with how the budget was allocated. They really didn't know how the budget was allocated. It seems like like those kind of questions really should have been posed to um, the 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 unit line. Sorry, line unit per, unit per, unit manager. Unit, I'm sorry, guys. I totally forgot. I, I've got to look back at my notes. But the unit manager, or unit producer, folks in the chat can can uh, can correct me on that. Um, but she she testified the other day. Oh yeah, pickle Gabrielle Pickle. Yes, yes, she's the one line producer. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and uh, and yeah, Gabrielle Pickle. So so like that's like these these questions should have are are more appropriately directed to her than these guys. They're 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 no nothings. They they're there to to schmooze with with wealthy people to to get them to open their pockets to these these poor little producers who are just trying to put together an indie film you know and and that's going to be the best thing ever and it's going to return an investment um but the the question about the tax shelters it's like it's like what she's trying to get at there is is you know with the people like were you guys interested in just attracting these investors for this film because it's less about making a quality film done right with all the safety precautions in place or was it more about just trying to get you know lower your tax basis you know on your your 2021 taxes and you know like like having some kind of an, an excuse like whatever the the result ends up, ends up being um but uh but yeah um that's 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 what she was getting at i don't think it really succeeded do you swear or affirm under penalty of law that the testimony you'll give in this case will be the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth i do yeah. thank you have a seat talking to the microphone please <clears throat> Sir, go ahead and state your name for the record. John Ziello. Mr. Ziello, what do you do for a living? Ah, spell I, it. Uh, grip in the film industry. Um, explain to the jury what a grip is. Uh, grips do the non-electrical lighting as well as camera rigging, any overhead rigging, uh, mounting car, man cameras on cars, um, all the fun stuff. We're the, the MacGyvers on set. <laughs> Excellent. Um, and, uh, Mr. Ziello, how, how many different film sets in your career do you think you have worked on? Um, yeah, you, you can include TV and uh, yeah, hundreds. I work in commercials and television, so quite a lot. And were you employed as a grip on the set of the movie rust? I was the key rigging grip. And what's a key rigging grip? Is it any different than what you previously described? Uh, usually you would have a department that's separate from the actual uh, grips. There's a key grip. And then the key rigging grip is a parallel to him. So you have your own department separate from his, but you carry out orders basically from the DP together. So. And the DP being the director of photography? Yeah. And Helena. was that Ms. Hutchins? Helena in this case, yes. Um, and... Uh, during your career, how long have you worked in the film industry? Uh, 15 years. And during the 15 years that you've worked in the film industry, if you can estimate for the jury, um, how many times do you think you've worked on movie sets uh, or TV with armorers? Uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 to 50, maybe. Okay, a fair number of times. Yeah. Um, were there issues with regard to guns and gun safety on the set of Rust that stood out to you? Yes. Uh, can you describe those for the jury? Um, Objection. Probably trying to get into, or well, it's going to have something to do with the scope in which he can testify. Um, this one, I'm wondering if, if this witness, I mean, he must've been there when it happened, when, when the shooting happened. Um, I'm wondering if he also has a lawsuit. If so, 
I would hope for the prosecution's sake that she, that um, she decides to ask about it on direct as opposed to allowing that to come in on cross-examination. I mean, for this guy's sake, really, so that it's not a repeat of of uh, what happened with the, the, the dolly grip guy, uh, Walter White. Carolyn V, I think the walk-off people were were camera people. So he's he's part of the lighting department. So I think that is a different group of people. But I mean, hey, we'll we'll find out one way or another, right? Okay, here. Let's uh Let's fast forward here during this sidebar, not snide bar. Mr. Ziello, when you were working on this set of rest, did you personally see um, issues with firearm safety that concerned you? Uh, yes, I did. Will you explain to the jury what's coming to mind as I'm asking you that question. Um, on two separate instances, I came across the the cart where they uh, moved the guns around. The armors would bring them to set and set their cart up. And on two separate instances, I came across that cart basically unmanned with nobody around it. Hey. And, uh, you know, looking well, around. Let, 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 let me stop you there. Mm -hmm. uh, was there anything on the cart that caused you to be concerned about the fact that it was unmanned? Yes, there were firearms and ammunition on top of the cart. Oh, Jesus. And why did it concern you that it was unmanned? It's just not something you see normally on a set. Um, it felt wrong and it looked, you know, somebody, anybody could have done anything they wanted to those weapons. And nobody would know. In your experience working on movie sets with armors, uh, is that something that you usually see? No, there's usually a chain of custody. Gun goes from armorist to actor, back to armorist, back to storage. Um, can you recall ever seeing guns and ammunition uh, laying out unattended on a movie set? No. Uh, was there um, anything else uh, with regard to firearm safety that uh, you witnessed that caused you concern? Um, one instance, we had a, a large scene in the cowboy town, like in the main part of the um, western town, and there were a lot of guns involved in the scene. We had finished the majority, like the big uh, wide part, and I was I ended up standing next to an actor who still had his uh, pistol in his holster, was not in the current scene because we had moved on to another scene, and. He was playing with it, messing with it, and I just jokingly was like, hey, don't shoot me, you know, with that, <laughs> quit messing with that thing. I, you know, I stand right next to him, and it, it's not something you normally see. Um, oh, so geez. was Ms. Gutierrez supervising that actor when he was playing around with his gun? No, he was standing by, either waiting to go in again, possibly, or hanging out after he had just finished. I'm not sure. In your experience working on uh, film sets with armorers, are the actors generally permitted to walk around with their uh, real prop guns and manipulate them? Again, there's usually a, like a strict chain of custody, they call it, and it's armorist, gun, gun back to armorist, back to storage. You don't usually see them left with the actors. Um, in your career, have you ever seen that, that you can recall? I don't think so. Okay. Um, and sir, were you um, present on set on October 21st, 2021? Yes. Um, I want to start, why don't we start at lunch? Okay. Um, did you have lunch with the crew that day? I did. Uh, and how did you get back? And just to be clear, <laughs> How far away is the lunch area from the town and the church? Uh, about a quarter mile. It's walkable, but there's vans and you get rides typically. And 
I had my personal vehicle on set, my truck, and I would use it to go back and forth. Okay. Uh, and on that day, did you drive yourself to, to the lunch area? Yeah. And did you drive yourself back? I did, but I also picked up Helena and drove her back with me on that day. And where did you, did, did you drop Ms. Hutchins off anywhere? Yeah, right at the church. I dropped her off in front of the church. Um, and just to be clear, were you in the church at the time of the incident? I was not. Um, where, let me ask you this, were you close enough that you heard the incident? I was about 100 yards away. Uh, I heard everything. Well, I heard the gunshot go off. Um, do you have experience with real firearms? Some. Um, when you heard that sound and you were, I think you said about 100 yards away, mm -hmm. um, did you have any idea what it was? I honestly didn't know if it was part of the, sh the scene. I didn't know if they had started or not. I, I did not. It didn't raise any major concern to me until someone came out yelling, call 911. Um, and is, is that something that you heard on your radio or did you see that with your own eyes? Uh, I saw that with my own eyes. I heard them yelling. To call 911? Yeah. And um, what did you do when you realized that there was some type of an emergency? Uh, I immediately ran into the church. And what did you do when you got inside the church? Um, I saw Helena laying on the floor being worked on by the medic. And Joel was to the left. And our dolly grip, Ross, was attending to him. And the, uh, at that time, all the pews were still really tight up on them. So I immediately started chucking pews out of the way. And I moved the dolly. And I cleared room for them to work on Helena. And did you stay in the church while they were uh, uh, performing life-saving measures on Miss, Miss Hutchins? Yeah, I did. I was, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I was directly involved in first aid with her oh. for a number of minutes before the paramedics had arrived on the scene. And when you say that you were directly involved in first aid with her, do you have any first aid training? No, I was just assisting. The medic was having trouble keeping the oxygen mask on Helena's face. She was oh. flailing and tearing it off. And oh. uh, myself, the gaffer, Serge, and our Steadicam operator, Reed, we're all around helping uh, stabilize her. I had her head and neck, Serge had her arms, and Reed had her ankles, I believe. Um, was it apparent oh. to you that she had suffered some type of a serious injury? Yeah. Um, and why was that apparent to you? Because there's blood everywhere. Uh, she was bleeding and in pain, and um, I saw the wound and realized it was life-threatening in the area there was. And, when you say you saw the wound, what do you? Where where was that? Uh, entry was under her right armpit, I believe, and exit was just inside of her shoulder blades. I think. And did you see both of those, the entry and the exit? Yeah. Okay. Um, and then uh, at some point, did you were you relieved uh, by paramedics? Yes, the paramedics showed up, and we all fell back and let them take over. Um. If you recall, when you were in the church attempting to render aid, uh, did you see Ms. Gutierrez or hear Ms. Gutierrez? No, she was. they cleared the church pretty quickly. Um, I pushed past whoever was maintaining the door at that moment and went in. Um, but they were, they were trying to keep everybody out of there. Okay. And um, at some point then, did you leave the church? Yes. And uh, when you left the church, where did you go? Uh, I, I left the church because they were calling a helicopter uh, and a life lifeline or whatever you call it. And they needed a landing zone cleared. And I immediately jumped on uh, channel three with the Teamsters and called for the water truck to come over and clear out a landing zone. And I started trying to get vehicles out of the way. I actually hopped in a police vehicle, <laughs> tried to move it and quickly had an officer come up and say he would do it. <laughs> um, this guy strikes me as like the kind of guy that I would want to have, a, like, like be working with, whether it's on a movie set or elsewhere. Like I just, 
like I, I, I want this guy around because he's obviously like the kind to like run to help regardless of like, you know, he's like, I, I don't have first aid training, but I was helping in like the ways that I could assisting the medic and moving pews and then helping to clear a, clear a, uh, a, a zone for the helicopter to land. And it's just like, like this is coming off very, 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 very genuine, um, and very, very sympathetic. So, um, well, I mean, like I said, the, the one thing that could, could undermine this testimony is if there's a lawsuit, uh, a civil lawsuit that he's filed and if, and depending on how they handle it. Sure. Um, did you take note of anything when you were outside the church? Did anything catch your eye? Um, <clears throat> I believe after that, um, the helicopter thing, I came back and saw uh, Dave Halls and Hannah having a conversation. Dave Halls was asking Hannah to see the the pistol and wanted to clear the gun and look at it and see what was in it. And I believe he retrieved it. I think in my um, initial interview, I said she had grabbed it, but uh, in my notes that I took afterwards, I, I believe he was the one who actually pulled the pistol out of the church and brought it outside. Um, that was also a really good thing that he just did because he, he already noted an inconsistency between what he told police and what he had written in his notes. So like him, him volunteering that like at the outset, not even being asked about it, but just saying like, I initially said this, but you know, when I, when I revisited my notes, then, you know, I realized that, that it was, that it, that it was David Halls that, that had, that had retrieved the gun, not Hannah Gutierrez Reed. So, so, you know, this is really, really good for his credibility, just saying that. And it's like, it doesn't sound like he's volunteering that in a way that's like extra speedy to try to like look a certain way. Like it just seems like, like he's just trying to be as honest and forthright as possible. I, I, this guy, this guy's got really great credibility so far. And were they, were they standing around or over a cart? Yeah, there was a, a Rubbermaid, a black Rubbermaid cart just to the left side of the door. If you're looking at the front of the church, just to the left, it was tucked in. It was already, you know, it's kind of for shooting. We always tuck things in tight around the door and it was just, it was already there and we, and they, they were standing in front of it. And what, uh, what were they doing? Uh, they were removing the bullets from the gun and attempting to check them and see you know, which were dummies and which weren't or what happened. And did you have any concerns about that? I, I did. It, it immediately felt wrong to me. And I, I thought to preserve it, I pulled my cell phone out and actually held it up, you know, tried to record that happening. Oh, and I was just so flustered that I actually didn't push record. So oh. I didn't get any footage actually, but I stood there holding my phone as though I were the entire time. Um, so you were attempting to video record them taking the rounds out of the gun. Yeah. Did you happen to see what happened to those rounds? Yeah, they uh, took them out one by one, shook them, checked them, and I believe they ended up on the Rubbermaid cart um, at, as they were going through them. Okay. That's really helpful for the prosecution. Really, really helpful. Because remember during the uh, leading investigator's testimony yesterday, there was this question about, you know, did did the rounds end up, did Hannah Gutierrez Reed unload the firearm and put the rounds on the on the top of the cart? Or did she put them in a pocket or something like that? Because those rounds that were found on the prop cart, none of them were missing that primer cap. And what she said in her interview was, I, I opened up shortly before the, 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 the blocking that they did. I checked the gun by opening up the cylinder to see the back. And, and four of them didn't have primer caps. One of them, you know, had a hole in the side. And then I put in the sixth round. So she could have she could have seen that four of them were were missing the primer caps. That you can tell from that angle. But the other stuff you can't tell unless you actually take them out. So this is this is really important here, coming from a super credible witness right now. You know, talking about about how he like what he saw, and very clearly saying they put him on that prop cart. This is very important for the state right here. Um, yeah, so far, so far, very credible, very sympathetic witness. 
And um, was this a rather stressful event for you? Yeah. Um, were you interviewed by the police in a trailer on October 21st? Yes. Um, and have you had a chance to review the statement that you gave? Yes. Um, can you tell the jurors what your thoughts are about the accuracy of your statement? Um, honestly, it was, it was pretty inaccurate. Um, I, I had just found out Helena died five minutes before that. And I was, uh, very emotional and I, yeah, in my, after watching it, it I, several times I, I misspoke in that. And why do you think that, that you misspoke and had some errors in your statement? Um, I don't know. I think I was just flustered and it, you know, I think I said there were five bullets when there were six. Um, it wasn't anything big, but it was just simple, okay. you know, errors. Uh, do you, do you recall in that interview describing, um, the armor as a blonde person? Uh, I believe I was talking about her assistant or who I thought was her assistant. Okay. Um, and yeah, but no, it wasn't, I wasn't trying to describe Hannah. Okay. Uh, you understood that Ms. Gutierrez was the armor. Yes. Okay. Um, thank you, sir. I'll pass the witness. Okay. Here we go. Cross exam. Cross exam. Thank you. <clears throat> Good afternoon, sir. How you doing? Do you recall um, when you gave that <laughs> statement mentioning that uh, the blonde hair's assistant had brought the firearm into the church? Right. And <clears throat> the blonde hair assistant on the movie was Sarah Zachary. Were you aware of that? Yes. Okay. So at the time, at least, um, when you gave that statement, you indicated that it was Sarah Zachary who had brought the firearm into the church. I believe I did, yeah. Okay. Now, you stated today that um, you gave that interview shortly after this had, this had happened, and it was traumatic, Is that, obviously. Yeah. So you you made several misstatements. Yeah, I believe someone uh, told me that she handed it off when we were after the incident, um, and, yeah, I don't know why I reported that. Okay. Well, and... Right after that, it's not wouldn't be unusual for you to make a mistake and, and something yeah. like that. Where was your were you, was it hard for you to even think and concentrate? Yeah, oh. definitely. I was still crying in there. And um, when they interviewed you, were you um, still at the on the set? Were you still there? Yeah, they made us wait around to be interviewed. Um, anybody who was directly involved. You also talked about the cart on direct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you need a no, it's fine. Go ahead. Okay, sir. Yeah. You also talked about the cart, and you indicated that when they came out to load, it was the rubber made cart. Yeah. And do you recall also that it? You thought it would it was the special effects cart. Yeah, the special effects guys had a lot of gear in and around that area for the scene that was happening. They had a bunch of poppers set up in the church. And they, I believe their firing station was in that area, so that's why I indicated that. Okay, that's one of the things you said, though, that, that they had loaded it by the special effects cart. Yeah, okay, uh, so. it may have been. I honestly don't even know if that was a special effects cart or if it was the armor's cart now. I can't tell you. Okay, so as we sit here today, I mean, is it fair to say because of the trauma of those events that maybe your memories affected some, which wouldn't be unusual. Um, I took contemporaneous notes in the days after and have a pretty good recollection of what happened in that I'm sorry. time frame. Okay. Um, this is totally appropriate questioning and it's a good point because trauma does affect memory. It affects, well, I don't, perception, I suppose, but, you know, our, our memories are flawed to begin with, but when trauma enters the picture, the, your memory can be even, even worse. It typically is 
much worse. So this is this is really, really good, ripe territory to cross-examine on. And he's doing it in a way that is respectful of him. And it's allowing him to maintain like like dignity and whatnot, basically like not faulting him, not shaming him. So so this this is this is good. This is this is a much softer cross than what he did with the Dolly Grip guy. So I have a feeling that there is not a civil lawsuit that this guy filled filed. Sorry. So and I think that that is probably the reason, well, maybe one reason why he's going softer on this cross examination than on the other one. Um, and also one point that I want to make is that this witness so far is a fantastic example of how you can have inconsistencies in testimony, especially in comparison to prior, prior statements, prior, you know, prior evidence, and you can still have them come away as a very credible witness. A lot of it comes from taking out the sting yourself and being very open about it. One of the big differences between this guy and the Dolly Grip guy is that he's being open about all of the flaws all of the sore spots. And that is just taking away a lot of the power of those things that that could have been used by the defense on cross-examination. Uh, I want to ask you about the incident you were talking about with the cart and the firearms left out on it. Sure. Um, are you certain those firearms were not replicas? I have no idea. They could have been. Okay. And um, when you walk by that cart, do you know what time of day it was? Uh, it was or late morning. Early morning. Late, it? late morning. Late morning. Mm -hmm. And do you know what day that was? Uh, I no, I couldn't give you a date today. Um, we had just shot a big one of the bigger uh, gun scenes where we had, um, I believe, it was the most guns in any scene that we had had at that time. Uh, and because of how many guns were involved, did you see the armor and, and her or Sarah Zachary, her boss? Did you see them attending to those firearms? In that during that scene, yes. Okay. Um, so when you saw the cart, was the scene completed? Yes. Okay. Did you see them still dealing with the firearms? No. Okay. We had moved on into another building, I believe, around the corner, and that cart was left behind. Okay. And any of them. Um, you didn't know whether they were replicas or not. Did you report that to anybody? No, I did not. Okay. And the other instance, I think you were talking about uh, kind of joking with somebody that had his firearm still. Did you report that to anybody? Probably no, not. I did not. Okay. We are, I don't have any further questions. That was a decent cross. Just a couple quick follow Okay, follow redirect. Your Honor, may I have just one moment? I'm sorry. Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, that was, that was, a that was, it was good that he you kept it kind of short. Uh, when you walked outside and saw that cart, did you know whether the prop cart was over by the black tent? What, when are you referring to? Yeah, I'm sorry. When you came out and saw them unloading the, uh, the firearm, uh -huh. was the prop cart, do you recall it being near the black tent or not? I don't believe it. I, was there a black tent there? I think... There was a black tent on the right side of the building, and the cart was on the left side, if I recall. Okay. The cart that you remember seeing? Yeah, the cart that was just outside the door to the left. Okay. Okay, thank you. Regret. And just to be clear, Mr. Ziello, did you see who brought the firearm into the church after lunch that day? No. Um, the day that you saw the uh, firearms unattended on the cart, uh, you indicated that there was a big uh, gun scene that had just happened. Mm -hmm. and, and just if you don't mind saying yes for that. Yes, record, sorry. Okay. Excuse me. Um, and in that scene that was taking place that day, uh, if you recall, did it involve the firing of blanks? It did. Um, do fake guns fire blanks? Not to my knowledge. And the gun that was uh, on the actor, was there anything about it that caused you to think it was a fake gun? No, that was a real gun. It was a real gun. Yeah. Okay, thank you, sir. I don't have anything else. 
appreciate you. All right, you're excused. Thank you. Your honor. Yeah, that was a great witness for the state. David Halls. David Halls. Oh my gosh. Okay. Now here comes the the fire on his cross examination. But you know, this is um I'm ending the poll now. And it looks like 76% of you do not plan to see rust after this trial. 23% say yes. I feel bad for people like the last witness because they put their hard work into a film like this and then people don't want to see it because of all of this that happened. Do you swear or affirm under penalty of law that the testimony you'll give in this case will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. All right, have a seat talking to the microphone. Thank you. Would you like some water, sir? I would, please. Okay, thank you. Looks like Barnes here. Give me just one moment to swallow my notes. Ooh. Before we get there, there was a question about his his plea deal. Um, and actually, let me let me get some questions here. I'm sorry for the interruption. Uh, why is prosecution bringing rebuttal witnesses now? Do they not have rebuttal after defense case rests? Um, you're referring to the producers, so they are they are not necessarily rebuttal witnesses to the defense's case in chief. They are rebuttal to what has come up in in testimony already, which is the idea that that Hannah Gutierrez Reed made complaints to production about say uh, about you know Alec Baldwin's um Alec Baldwin's um um you know his cross draw training as well as the the hours that she needed for um for her work as as an armorer to properly do her job that was rebutting those points which have come up already in this in the state's case in chief so despite the fact that this they feel like rebuttal witnesses um they're they're properly brought within their case in chief uh Jacob Theron um do you mind explaining what's going on during these sidebars? I'm sure they're shooting more than just the shit. Um, yes, they they absolutely are. What they are doing is they are arguing about the objection that that has been said. Now we have less information um, than we did yesterday about what they're objecting to, but based on context, I can usually figure it out. You know, either either leading or foundation or, you know, this is improper opinion testimony. And what they're doing is they're going back and forth arguing as to why it's proper or why it's improper. And then the judge makes a ruling and then they come back and, and the person who's who's examining either either proceeds with the question that they had or they decide to change directions. But I can I can explain more during the next sidebar as well, just to, to kind of point it out. Jerry Roth, can the judge force the special counsel to wear contacts? No, I don't think so. <laughs> and Jerry Roth, if Dave Halls testifies, wouldn't he immediately have his credibility ruined because he took a plea deal? Well, I mean, there's definitely a lot that has been said about David Halls. Him taking a plea deal is not one of them. So we are going to be hearing about it probably in his direct. I'd be very surprised if we don't hear about it in his direct. Um, it can cut either way. Either he looks like he got Scott free because he got a sweetheart deal or it can look like he's the guy that decided to not fight his charge and took accountability and therefore was like rewarded by the state for it. Um I'm also told that during his interview I haven't seen his his police interview but um uh, I, I do remember someone saying that uh, during his police interview, he was like really taking accountability of like, I should have checked. I should have done this. I should have done that. I would anticipate that he's probably going to to take that accountability on the stand on direct examination as well. And that's going to take some of the 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 wind, if not a lot of the wind, out of the defense's argument that she's the only one that is that is being held responsible here, that she's taking the fault of everybody else despite all of the mistakes that other people have made and the things that they should have done differently. So if he comes in like hat in hand, which I suspect he will, it's gonna it's gonna take away a lot of the defense's argument on that point in particular. All right, let's let's get into it. I'm very excited to see this. State your full name for the record, please. David John Halls. Mr. Halls, what do you do for a living? I am retired. I was a uh, first assistant director. Yeah, he's retired now, all right. Motion pictures and television. Programs. How long were you a first assistant director? Oh, since the mid-90s. I think uh, we could probably use 
for motion pictures, the 94, since 1994. Okay, and I'm gonna ask you to move that microphone a little closer to you, okay? Mm -hmm. um, he officially retired on October 21st, 2021. October 2021, were you employed on the set of the movie Rust? I was. And were you employed in that capacity as a first assistant director? I was. Can you explain to the jurors what a first assistant director does? A first assistant director, um, will uh is responsible for creating the schedule uh first assistant director will do that in collaboration with the, the director and, and producers um that's a, a a process of taking the script and and breaking it down and um what what actors are going to be needed in, in in which scenes what props are going to be needed what pieces of wardrobe are, are going to be needed what special effects will be needed and that is all broken down into a, a software program that's pretty universal in the industry and that generates documents that can be uh, uh, distributed to the different departments the different department heads and uh, and the, my department, the, the first assistant, the assistant director's department is kind of the a contact point for the cast. So it, it's really a position of disseminating information. This is all during the, the pre-production process. And then once uh, production shooting begins, the first assistant director would be, I. An analogy would be you're you're the the shop foreman or the site foreman. You're you're overseeing and making sure that the production is following the schedule, that things are moving efficiently, and that people are given the cast crew are given the information that they need to know. And sir, as the first assistant director on the set of rest, were you what's called a safety coordinator? Yes, that is part of my title, yes. And what do you do as a safety coordinator? It's uh, to make sure that the, the different departments and, and cast are, are, are following the, the safety protocols, that there, there are written safety protocols that are produced in uh, an alliance between the, the, the different uh, unions and guilds in the industry, Screen Actors Guild, the, the, the unions that represent the technicians. Um, and it's just to observe, to make sure that mitigating any, any, any safety risks. Um, did you feel personally, um, up until October 21st, that Rust was a relatively safe set. I did. Um, That's surprising. Did you yourself have any concerns about um, Ms. Gutierrez's uh, behavior as an armor? I did not. And is part of your role as the first assistant director to be a part of the uh, safety check of firearms that that's taking place on set yes uh, can you just describe for the jury generally the way that 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 should work yeah uh, yeah i was going to say typically but usually all the, all the time, whenever there's a, a firearm on set. I do, I do not work with a lot of first assistant directors, but I'm, I am assured that this is a protocol that all assistant directors uh, follow, that whenever a firearm is, is on set, I, I make an announcement. In the, in the case of Rust, I, I had a wireless microphone that was connected to a, a, a public address, a speaker system, so everybody could hear. And, gen, and all the time, whenever there was a firearm on set, I would make an announcement there was a firearm or firearms on set. I'm inspecting them 
with the armor. If any, if anybody else would like to inspect the gun, now would be the time. And you're just certainly welcome to do that. Um, I would also, if there was ever an incident where the the firearm had to be fired a blank, um, I would make that announcement. There will be live live fire in this shot. Uh, ear ear and eye protection are provided. Please please protect your ears. On the set of rest, can you tell the jury what the safety checks with Ms. Gutierrez consisted of? It's 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 really what I just said that whenever. Uh, and let me let, let me stop yeah, you and yes. ask a, a more pointed question. I, I guess what I'm interested in is. Did Ms. Gutierrez load the gun in front of you? Uh, on uh, on any occasion, um, just kind of walk us through your experiences with blanks, with dummies, with Ms. Gutierrez, um, and and let let's for the purposes objection of objection compounds assume that, that there's going to be blank firing. Okay. Yes. Um, we assume there's going to be blank firing prior to handing the gun to an actor. Is there a safety check that is done with you and Ms. Gutierrez? Yes. She, she, show me that there, there's an empty gun at that moment before she would load the blank round. She would also show me the barrel of the gun to make sure that there's no obstructions in the barrel. And so let me ask you, um, when she would show you the barrel, were you able to see all the way down the barrel? On the, on the, on the revolvers, I, yes, I, I certainly was. Uh, I, I recall there might have been a, a rifle that I might not have been able to get a you know a clear to, to see light at the end of the barrel. Okay, um, so she loads the the gun with the blanks in front of you. Is mm -hmm. that right? Yes. And then what happens then? And then she would give it to the actor. And was it, in your mind, permissible for her to then walk away and go do something else? During the moments of, of a live fire? Sure. No, not acceptable for her to walk away. Okay. Um, let's talk about instances where a gun would be uh, loaded with dummies. Yes. Um, when you would do the safety check with Ms. Gutierrez, would she load the dummies in front of you and shake them so that you could hear that they were dummies? There were only two occasions where dummy rounds were used. On, let, me, on let, let, me, let, me, let me stop you right there. When you say there, was, there were only two occasions that dummy rounds were used, How do you know that that dummies were in the guns on those two occasions? Is it because Ms. Gutierrez approached you and told you? She, she did. Okay. Uh, do Would you know if there were times that she would dummy up the guns and not bring them to you and not tell you? No. The, the, the normal every day, every moment that there was a firearm that was being handed to a, an actor, she would always bring the, the, the gun to the firearm to me and we would do an inspection of the, of the firearm. And you only recall two instances where firearms were dummied. Yes. And was one of them on October 21st? Yes. And the other one, did that involve uh, a revolver or, or, or a long gun? A long gun. Okay. Um, so, Let's talk about October 21st. I want to, I'm going to start with you um, after the lunch hour. What was happening after lunch? What were we doing there? We were preparing a shot for Mr. Baldwin's character. It, it, he was sitting in a pew. He's been on the run. He's taking refuge in this, this old church and he's sitting in the pew and the, and the, what we were photographing. I'm sorry, I'm trying to avoid the word shot. 
Um, we we're preparing for the shot of Mr. Baldwin sitting in the pew. It was basically from his waist to the top of his head and, and his action was just to pull out the revolver. And in the story, he's pointing at, he's pointing the revolver at two U.S. Marshals that, that have come into the church. Okay. Um, that, that was what you were intending we're, to do. That's what we were preparing to. Yes. Lighting. Yes. Um, and this has been referred to as blocking the shot. Is that your recollection? You could re refer to that. You could say that. Yes. Can, Do can I just, there's been a lot of talk about rehearsal and I, I just like to clarify okay. well, is, if that's okay. With let me, let, uh, let's, let's finish this line of questioning yeah. first. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's an example of somebody of a witness wanting to give more information outside the scope of what he's been asked. And this is good, uh, good by the, 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 the prosecutor, good by Carrie Morrissey by saying, we're going to get into that in a minute. Let me ask you another question. So, um, you know, it's, it's, you can tell at this point, he wants to get something off his chest. He want like it sounds like he want like this is very uncomfortable for him, but he wants to be here to testify this. That's the impression that I'm getting right now, so, which is good for the state. Was this a rehearsal or was it just setting up the shot? Immediately after lunch, we were setting up the shot. Mr. Baldwin was not called to set. And is that common that that it, it, it was Mr. Baldwin considered first team? That is what we refer to in the motion picture industry as what we refer to the cast as first team. Okay. Um, so when the shots being set up, is first team usually there? No. Okay. They don't come in until it's ready, ready to shoot. Yes. I, I mean, there, there, are, there are occasions that we might have shot a, 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 a shot with, with cast and now we're going to shoot, we're going to do it at a different angle and do lighting and they might stay, stay there. Okay. It just depends on the amount of time that would, that would okay. be needed to light, prepare the shot. But Mr. Baldwin was not present at that time. So on October, by the way, real quick, I just want to address this just because this is an, an interesting point with a lot of talk at the rehearsal. That sounds like he might have been watching the trial. Keep in mind, there's been a lot of commentary around this whole incident, and he has been one of the main focuses of like wrongdoers um, by a lot of people. So so he I, I think it would be it would be foolish of us to assume that he, Hannah Gutierrez Reed and Alec Baldwin have not been paying attention to the commentary, whether it's through mainstream media or social media. Um, and, 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 you know, been following along a lot of this stuff as well. So, um, yeah, so I, I don't necessarily think that that automatically means he's been watching the trial. I think there's probably been a lot of talk about this subject in the in the massive cloud that's been over this whole incident just overall in general which is not it's not impermissible for him to be aware of of that for 21st after lunch they're setting up the shot uh do you recall who was uh in the church i do go ahead and tell us who you recall being there miss hutchins um Joel Souza, Serge Svetnoy, Ross did you say, and I'm gonna. Uh, did you say Serge Svetnoy? Yes. Okay, go ahead. Ross Adiego, Reese Price, Thomas Gandy, Roman Gandy. This is during preparation. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is pre uh, Mr. Baldwin arriving on set. Um, I believe the the microphone boom operator Zach Sneeby might have been in the room at the, in the church at that time. Um, Was Ms. Mitchell in the church at that time or not yet? I I don't recall seeing her there okay. at that time. Okay. Uh, you know what? I, dirt, dirt, uh, Mr. Souza would not have been. I don't think he was in the church during the preparation. 
Okay. Time. So at what point in time do you have contact with Ms. Gutierrez? When Mr. Baldwin was called to set, when he arrived on the set. Who called Mr. Baldwin to set? I did. Um, did you at the same time make any request for the armor or armor services? I did not. Did you ask for the gun? I, I did not ask for the gun. A and why wouldn't you have asked for the gun? Because it's, it's normal procedure on certainly all of the productions that I've worked on with firearms. And the, the, it's not just for firearms, it's for props and wardrobe that when, when first team is called to set, it's announced over a walkie talkie. The first assistant director would go onto the walkie talkie and say, camera is ready, first team, please. This, this alerts all the different departments Certainly costumes, because they're going to need to do whatever, put a piece of uh, costume on, on the actor, make adjustments, hair and makeup, you're gonna, they're going to need to do their touches, props, they're going to need to give the prop that's needed to the actor. And, the, and this is also a signal, a cue to the armor that the actor that needs the firearm is going to be on set and I should be there, the armor, as a, me, the armor, I should be there to give the gun to the actor. Okay, so you didn't actually call for the gun, but you agree that Ms. Gutierrez may have understood that it would be time for her to come into the church. Yes. So much better than the speaking objections. Okay. She's trying, she's still trying to argue with him without approaching. Sidebars, not sidebars. <laughs> okay, get some questions while we wait. Miss Fitness 3, in your post verdict jury interview, did remorse matter? Well, I haven't done any criminal cases. I've been in civil litigation, but um, remorse, I think, always will, will make a difference. Maybe not always, but in very many cases will make a big difference to the jury. They're human beings, after all. If somebody is not showing remorse and they should, people Disregard want to punish. The question asked. All right, thank you. And it, my apologies. All right, let, me, let me go back five seconds. Disregard the question asked. All right, thank you. And okay. it, my apologies. Um, just to be clear, you don't know what Ms. Guti what Ms. Gutierrez thought uh, or why she did what she did in that moment, correct? You, you don't know that Ms. Gutierrez thought to herself, I better come into the church. You're, you're making that assumption, correct? I'm, I'm making that assumption. Okay. Um, and, but, but to be clear, you did not call for the gun. No. Okay. Um, does Ms. Gutierrez appear in the church? Yes, very shortly after Mr. Ball won appeared on set. Okay, go ahead and and kind of walk us through this. Tell us about when Mr. Baldwin appears uh, in the church and, and and then Ms. Gutierrez and walk us through what happens. Mr. Baldwin entered the church. He took his position where he was needed in the in the pew of the church. I'm I'm standing in front of Mr. Baldwin, facing Mr. Baldwin. Um, it was no more than five feet from him. I was a body with to what would be his left. And Miss Gutierrez appeared on my left hand side with the with the revolver and she said, let's let's do the gun check. She opened up the latch to show the drum of the revolver. She rotated the cylinder. It was it was empty. Check the barrel. It was what was referred to as a cold gun. And uh, Ms. Gutierrez just took a, a few steps and, and gave the gun to Mr. Baldwin. He he skipped a he skipped a detail. He he she opened the barrel, and it was a cold gun. I I want to know what he saw that told him or or what he saw or heard that told him that it was a cold gun. I'm sure she'll she'll ask a follow up. Now, 
it's your recollection at that point in time that the gun was empty. It did not have dummies in it. It was absolutely it was empty. Okay. Uh, and you looked at it, correct? I, I looked at it, yes. Now, let me oh, stop for a moment. Lunch? Okay. So he says it was empty. Uh, this must be before lunch, and then she loaded them afterwards. Were there any opportunity – at any point in time during that day, did you – sit in for Mr. Baldwin. I did. When was that? After lunch. Okay. And when you sat in for Mr. Baldwin, was the firearm in the church? No. Okay. So why don't we talk a little bit about that? Uh, when you're, why are you sitting in for him? Explain to the jury how that happens. Well, t t uh, usually there is a stand in for the actor, a, a person and most times it's a person that that uh, matches the height and, and hair color look of the actor. Um, in uh, there was a stand in for Mr. Baldwin. Um, and when when I entered the church after lunch, the stand in for Mr. Baldwin was there. And because of covid. I, I wanted to keep the amount of people in the church to you know, just and I typically do that anyway, outside of the pandemic, before the pandemic, it just in, in, in smaller spaces, I would try to keep what I usually say is, if you don't have to be there, please don't. So because of COVID and just generally, I'd like to keep only the people that are needed for the shot there. I, I said, was needed. Uh, his name was Bill. I said, Bill, it, it's okay. I can, I can sit in for for uh for alec and um and it was it was a good opportunity just uh, as if i'm sitting in the pew right now i can observe everything the crew preparing and um that's what that's what i did um I did you did you need to have a firearm at that point in time? i did not no did you have a firearm at no that point i did time? not were you using anything to mimic a i i recall holding up my hand like this figure oh what come on why did you skip ahead like this at least we have a visual of him pointing a finger gun i'm so mad about this Oh, there it is. Were you using anything to mimic a firearm? I, I recall holding up my hand like this is a bigger. Just so that they could set up the shot? Yeah. Okay. Um, so after the setting up of the shot, after you sitting in for Mr. Baldwin, just to be clear, it's your recollection that Mr. Baldwin came in and Ms. Gutierrez came in around the same time. Yes. Okay. Um, she does the gun check with you. You see an empty gun. To your recollection, Ms. Gutierrez hands the gun to Mr. Baldwin. Is that right? That's correct. What happens after that? How do we end up with a gun that is no longer empty? I did not see the gun taken away from Mr. Baldwin. I'm still in the, the same position facing him, body width to his left, no more than five feet in front of him. You know, as an assistant director, you're, you're, you're looking around, you're observing, you're communicating with people. I did not see Ms. Gutierrez take the gun from Mr. Baldwin, but she appeared back on my left hand side and she said that she had put dummy rounds in, into the revolver. And at that point in time was another safety check done. She opened up the latch to the revolver. I recall seeing three to four, what I believe to be dummy rounds. I had seen the dummy rounds before. And when you say you saw them before, are you talking about that day or? Before that day. Okay. And, and let me ask you, under what circumstances would you have seen the dummy rounds if the only other time that guns were dummied up was a rifle? Yes. And I believe on that day, I did see those dummy rounds on her cart. Okay. So you, un you were familiar with what they looked like? 
that had a very distinctive bright brass end to it that what would be the end of the ship the bottom of the shell casing and all the primers were depressed meaning that this has already been a bullet that has been fired and uh, but sir let me know. ask you you indicated that you only saw three or four um you didn't see six i don't recall see her full, fully rotating the cylinder okay um you don't recall her fully rotating it i do not okay and even though the cylinder wasn't fully rotated um did you let that safety check sort of pass i did okay and what's your recollection about what happened to the gun after that she took a few steps to mr ball and gave miss ball and the gun okay um and let me ask you sir uh were you criminally charged in this case i was and did you enter a no contest plea to negligent use of a firearm? I did. And why did you do that? When I say why, what, what, what in your mind caused you to be, um, what caused a plea uh, to negligent use of a firearm to be appropriate? What did you do that, that, that would justify that? I was negligent in checking the gun properly. Okay, that's the reason that you took that plea, is that right? That's correct. Um, so, to the best of your recollection- That it's coming out on direct. Ms. Gutierrez hands the gun to Mr. Baldwin. Walk us through what happens after that. Uh, the, the revolver is uh, placed, uh, Mr. Baldwin had a, a, a holster that the, the gun was basically at, at his chest. And um, his action was to take the gun out and, and point it at what had been the two U.S. Marshals. And he was just, he was pulling it out. I'm sure he was getting used to that, that action. He was in communication with Miss Hutchins, about where to where to point the gun. Um, Do you recall, sir? Was Mr. Souza also in the room? He was. Um, was Mr. Souza also participating in how to set up this shot? Do you recall? No, I, I just recall that it was communication between Mr. Baldwin and and Helena. Okay. And then what happened? The gun went off. When the gun went off, what uh, what did you think happened? <sighs> There's so many thoughts. I honestly I did the, the idea that it was a live round of ammunition that went off was just not, it, it it wasn't computing it wasn't and uh it was a th my thought was that a blank round had been loaded and there have been other another instance um that a, an actor was 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 killed from a blank round and I just thought that there was there something in the blank round, a, a wadding I had heard at one time that maybe they used pieces of wax to keep the, the, the black powder in, in the blank round? Or was there an obstruction in the barrel? It just, it, again, it wasn't, it just, it just wasn't something I could compute in my mind. Sir, um... So I've got the poll on here on, on do you think he's hiding something or being honest? And it's like pretty split. 51% hiding something, 49% being honest so far. I'm I'm still I'm still leaving it open. I'll just say for for me, for my part, so far, I think he's I think he's being honest. I think that he's got a lot of discomfort talking about this, partly because he's been villainized so much by the press and by and on social media, I think, and throughout this trial. 
and he probably is um, afraid of <laughs> of a being a witness and b the cross examination <laughs> that's that's to come. Um, and he's probably I have the sense that he's thought a lot about this about what he's going to say and what he's going to you know like like how he's how he's going to say it um i think that his 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 emotions are showing but i still get the sense that he's like showing restraint like there have been some times where where he's kind of he's 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 had like a wavering voice but managed to like keep it keep it in I, I, to me to me it feels like he's like he's using using restraint on showing his emotions and it's like breaking through um We'll see how it holds up on cross examination. You know, if, is there going to be a sudden a sudden flip? You know, or or is he going to be relatively consistent here? Um, and yeah, I mean, and like I said before, I think that he wants to talk. He wants to to like tell his side of things. But I also have the sense that he's probably carrying around a lot of guilt and shame about it, and it's like being maybe being being open about it, talking a lot about it, maybe even over talking, um, is like, is like his kind of catharsis, um, for, for this whole thing. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, that's my impression so far. It might change as we, as we progress. For after you heard the gun go off, um, tell us what you saw in terms of the reaction by, uh, Ms. Hutchins and Mr. Souza. She looks really sad right now too. Ms. Hutchins is approximately is to my left, oh, maybe three feet, three feet away. Yeah, it was my recollection that I might have been the first person to her. She was on the ground. Perhaps uh, Ross Ariago might have been there, which would have made sense because he would he was the dolly grip and um, he would have probably, he would have been a cl close as anybody to Helena. Did you speak to Ms. Hutchins when you approached her? I did. What did you say? Are you all right? Did she respond? Yes. She said, I can't feel my legs. Oh, this is genuine emotion in my opinion. Oh. And when you're ready, just tell us what happened after that. You take a break if you need to. I'm ready. I, I I immediately left the church to make sure that 911 was being called. And the, the, the scent medic appeared at, and they, they were, she was treat, treating Ms. Hutchins and, and I just, I stayed out of the church. Just to keep, keep space. Do you know where the gun was um, in these moments after it went off? Was it, if you recall, was it left in the church? Was it taken out? I had an assumption where the gun was. What was going through my mind trying to determine what had happened? Again, the idea of a lot, you know, what was in the gun that would do this to two people? Still, no ability to compute that a live round of ammunition would have been in that gun. And I said, I, in an effort to triage the situation, I, I need to know what's in that gun. I went back into the church. I went to the pew. On the pew was the revolver. I grabbed the revolver. I left the church. I went to Miss Gutierrez's cart, which is on, if you're facing the church, it would be on the left-hand side of the church, right just immediately around the corner. I took it to her and I said, I need you to unload that gun. I need to know what it's in it. And did she unload the gun in front of you? She did. And what, what was taken out of the gun? I recall seeing five dummy rounds, again, with the distinctive brass, bright brass ends to them, and one 
shell casing that did not have a projectile on it and it had a completely distinctive looking into it when you say a distinctive looking into it are you what what are you referring to i recall it as being gray metallic gray and i recall that it, it was it was just completely different looking it was it's hard to explain there was some kind of machining or something maybe it was raised that's this is my recollection but it it a more contemporary looking bullet than what what i was seeing in the other rounds and let me ask you sir do you own guns i do not do you shoot guns? No, I do not. <clears throat> um, at any point in time in the afternoon after lunch, uh, did you tell Ms. Gutierrez to leave the church? Uh, can you refer, say that question Did you again? tell Ms. Gutierrez to leave the church? No. Um, Did you realize that she had left the church? I did not. Did you have an expectation that the armor would stay with the gun? I, that, I, I, that wasn't in but let, let, let me ask you, just in terms of your experience working on movie sets with guns and armorers, um, in your experience, does the armorer hand off a gun and then walk away and leave? That's not my experience. Okay. Um, um, at some point, did you realize that Ms. Gutierrez had not stayed in the church? I did not realize she had not stayed in the church. I, After the gun went off, where was she the next time you saw her? At her cart. Okay. And you just didn't know whether she was in the church or not? I, I did not know. Okay. Sir... Did you instruct Ms. Gutierrez or request that Ms. Gutierrez put dummies in the gun? I did not. Did you hear anyone ask her to put gummy, dummies in the gun? I did not. Now, we understand that you uh, entered into a plea agreement um, has it, were you placed on unsupervised probation? Yes. And and has that time period ended? Yes. Approximately when did it end? I think sometime in October. Okay. Um, are you under any legal requirement other than responding to a subpoena to come in here and testify? No. Uh, why have you agreed to testify in this trial? It's important to me that the truth be known, that, the, that Helena's husband and son, her family, know the truth of what happened. It's important that the cast and the crew, producers of Rust, know what happened. And it's important that, that the industry, the motion picture and television industry knows what happened so that this never happens again. All right, thank you, sir. I'll pass the witness. I think it's time for a bathroom break. So um, please don't talk among yourselves or anyone else about the evidence received here in court. So and, um, we'll be back at uh, about 2.35. That, that last answer does does feel a little bit canned. I'm not gonna lie. But you know, there there are there are those those parts where, you know, the attorney might want uh, might might want a, an emotional answer. 
Maybe he does genuinely feel that way. Um, but the reality is he is under a subpoena and you, you generally speaking, you can't just ignore a subpoena uh, to, to come and testify. All right. Let's skip ahead to, oh, is there, are we, ah, perfect. Good timing. So I think that there there are parts of it that are. Mr. Hall's back on. Absolutely. I think there are parts of it here that that the You're, the witness here is shortly. is wanting okay. to 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 <laughs> express, and I think that part of that is you know there there is a there is a bit of you may be seated emotional expression that might be bigger than we might sure. expect if he didn't want to express these things. Thank you, George. Some people see it as fake. Some people see it as as honest and open. Sure. I think that in terms of like, could any of this be self-serving? In terms of like legality, nothing. He's got nothing to gain or lose here. He's already got the plea deal. It's already done, done with. Um, but in terms of his career, he's retired. So he's not planning on working anymore. It's much more about his maybe reputation and how he's remembered because this sounds like this was his last job that he ever did. I don't think anyone would have hired him as a first AD after rust. And so he says that he's retired. So I, I imagine his retirement date started on October 21st, 2021. And so now it's just more like about what's his legacy going to be? How is he going to be remembered by people after his exit from the industry? So there, there, there definitely could be parts of it here that he's, he's, he's wanting to express more, whether that's sincere or not. I don't, I don't know. I mean, everybody's got a different opinion, but we are coming to cross exam. So we are going to see where that rubber hits the road. And we are live, aren't we? Yeah, so I can't fast forward anymore. Honestly, like for, for me personally, I feel like his his openness about the things that he did wrong, the fact that he says I was negligent um in in not checking not checking the the gun enough is very helpful to to how how the jury is likely to see him. He's not being evasive in in my opinion. You know, maybe he's he's wording things in a particular way. I don't know if, like, for me that, that it doesn't. It's not throwing up any any dishonesty sensors. And also, him saying. I, you know, I, I pled no contest because I was negligent in what I did. And here I am testifying at Hannah's trial. That also is driving the point to the jury that, hey, someone else has taken responsibility for this. It, like she's not, if you, if you find her guilty, she's not the only one that's going to be taking a fall for this. Lynn M. Kelly, just wondering, could AB be subpoenaed to testify in this case or the fact that he's also been charged prevent him from being forced to testify in this case? The latter. Um, he can and probably would invoke his rights under the Fifth Amendment to not self-incriminate. Um, he can even invoke that at his own trial. Um, so, you know, just like Hannah may or may not testify in this one. So while he has a danger of, of criminal liability... They can't force him to testify in any trial. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Charles, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Sir, I want to start with a question that we have. Um, can you say again what 
you saw when she unloaded the gun after the shooting incident? That's a jury question. Yes. I recall seeing five rounds, which were which were dummy rounds. They had the the bright brass ends to them, holes drilled in the side of the shell casing. The projectile still on top of the shell casing, and then one shell casing without a projectile on top of it, with a distinct, with di distinctively different looking end. Of, of the ball. Mr. Halls, on that, um, that portion of it, when you say distinctively looking in, can you describe that a little more? It was a, a metallic gray color versus the bright brass coloring of the other, uh, other rounds. And it, it just, from my recollection, it just, uh, there was a different kind of style to the end of, of that bullet. In, in my mind, it, there was maybe some raised machining, if you will, or something. That's just my recollection. Okay, yeah. sir. And do you mean the end of the casing? The end of the casing. So you're talking about the top of the casing, um, the end of it. Are you talking the, the top that would be empty or the bottom of it with the primer, where the primer would have been? If the end of the, if the, end of the casing is round... Okay. I'm looking at a full circle of the end of a, sh of a shell casing. Okay, I'm just trying to figure out, there wasn't still a projectile on that round. There was no projectile on yeah. that round. So you're just talking about the casing and the, the top of that. I'm the talking about the where the primer would be. This would be helpful with photos. Where the primer would be. So that's on the, the bottom of the round. Yes. Okay. And you said on the bottom there's a distinctively gray kind of color. He might be getting into asked and answered territory. So this is one of the one of the sidebars, not snide bars, but sidebars, <laughs> um, where they are going back and forth to bicker about whether or not he can ask the questions that he wants to ask. <laughs> um, and it's probably getting into ask and answer territory because he, like I said, he's, he's, um, he's kind of been asking similar kind of questions together here. At the same time, this is another example of where you just, you show a visual to help. Okay, sir, just one moment. We're going to pull a picture to show you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, may I approach? Mr. Hawes, I want to show you what's been entered as States Exhibit 26. <coughs> if you could take a look at that. Yes. And do you recognize that? Yes, it looks very similar to the dummy rounds that I saw. Okay. So yeah. that, and if I may show the jury room, this is States Exhibit 26. Well, sir, you, you indicated that that... You indicated that that resembled the round you were talking yeah, about. So. <laughs> it resembles the dummy rounds that I saw. Okay. The ends of the dummy rounds that I saw. The five dummy rounds? Yes, sir. Does it resemble that that sixth casing? No. Okay. So it, it looked even different than that. Than what we just saw. It didn't look like that. It did not look like that. Okay. Okay, we may come back to that, but I, I appreciate that explanation. Now, let me ask you some preliminary questions about your background. 
How long have you been in the film industry? I started in the film industry, I think around 1985. So, uh, 30 years? Ish, or, yeah. or yes, actually, over. 40 years. My, my math is, let me see, 15, so almost 40 years. From 40. 2021, I retired from the industry. Okay, somewhere in there, almost 30 years. Yes, sir. Okay. And you've been in a first assistant director for quite some time. How many years have you done that? Since the mid nineties, since about 1995. How many uh, films over the years have you worked as a, uh, as a first assistant director? Do you, do you recall? I don't have okay. a number really. I don't, it's That's over okay. 20. It's over. It could be 30. It, I, Okay. And how many have you worked on where there's been an armor? I could, I, I'm sorry. All part. Sir, I just. I would really have to sit down and do the and look at um, my resume. Um, for, for sure, 10 for sure. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and we're just, I'm not holding to a number, but of those 10, those approximate 10, have you ever worked on a set where there's been a part time armor? No. Okay. So, Rust film was the first time you've ever been on a set involving somebody doing armor duties and something else. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Here you were <laughs> aware that Miss Gutierrez Reed was performing functions of armor and props assistant? I was. Okay. Now, sir, as I understand, you did not have any concerns during the rest set about Miss Gutierrez Reed's work. I did not. Did you believe that she was diligent in her checks of firearms on set? I did. Okay. When on the, let's just give an example, there'd be a day where gun, uh, guns were going to be used and Miss Gutierrez Reed was present as armor, would she ask you to do weapons checks with her? Yes. Okay. And sir, when she does a weapons check with you, is that to open and show you the barrel and make sure there's no barrel obstructions? Yes. And I think you described earlier that with the revolver, you could see down through it. The light goes through, you could see through the barrel. Yes. Okay. Um, now, you also recall Ms. Gutierrez Reed had a tool to push down the barrel to make sure there's no obstructions? I don't recall seeing okay. that tool. But she was, would you describe her as uh, very diligent in that process when there was a weapons check required that she would do that with you? Yes. Okay. And do you know of any um, uh, any instance before the 21st where she did not do those weapons checks when, when they needed to be done with you? None whatsoever. Okay. Um, I know that you would have safety meetings. Now, would you have those every day of the set? We did not have them every day. Okay. And I know sometimes, do you recall getting emails that people wanted to have safety meetings? Yes. Okay. And at one of the safety meetings, do you remember Ms. Gutierrez Reed helping you with a presentation uh, as part of the briefing? On, on day one, the, the first day, yes. Okay, sir. And did you, what did you think about her presentation regarding the gun portion? I was very impressed with how she was very, she took control of the situation and was very clear and very instructive and communicated everything very clearly. And, and you're- And confidently. Okay. Um, this is something that's, that's also good for the state because it's good for this witness is, he, you know, he's not just, throwing her under the bus in every single way, saying, nope, she was incompetent. Nope, she didn't do her job right. Nope, she didn't, you know, she wasn't good here and there. Like he's 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 giving her compliments on other aspects of her work on set, which is which is showing that he's got nuance as to how he saw her job performance. Basically what it sounds like what he's saying so far is that up until October 21st, he thought that she was doing a great job. He was very satisfied with what she was doing. He was impressed by her presentation. He thought that she was very competent, very confident, and that she would do a, do a great job, you know, as, as of day one. 
Um, so this is this is someone who, in terms of his credibility, he's willing he's willing to give her compliments while also testifying against her, which is showing nuance, which shows like some sense of reasonability. Whether that's sincere or not, whether that's picked up as sincere or not, I don't know. But I'm j I just wanted to point that out as something that is interesting to me. And confidently, in your experience, having observed Armors in 10 other films, did she come across as seeming competent in what she was doing? She did. And the well, also, yeah. And this is this is also um, here that, that this also shows his ignorance and maybe he shouldn't have been the safety director. <laughs> um, that's also a, a very good point here. He did mention on, or he did say on, on direct examination that he's not overly familiar with guns. He doesn't have guns. He doesn't shoot guns, um, which again, should be some kind of a requirement if you're supposed to be overseeing all safety to include firearms on set. Um, so yeah, that just, it seems like another o oversight by production. But in terms of his personal credibility, you know, he he could st sit up there and be like, nope, she did everything wrong. Um, I already took my responsibility. Now here's her turn. Um, so it's it's. I don't know. It's interesting. It's interesting. And, and all of that is really kind of helpful to to the prosecution, to be honest. Did she come across as seeming knowledgeable about firearms? She did. Okay. Um. You said that was the first day. Do you recall there being a training for uh, a gun training specifically for the actors and crew? Be before the, the, the shooting um, schedule started, there was a day devoted to Ms. Gutierrez training actors. Okay, sir. And, and were you present at that? I was. And what was your, what was your impression of that training? Same, uh, Im impressed. She was confident uh there were some male actors um and she was didn't seem to be intimidated by them and oh that's and not good that for defense would, i felt that they respected her that's not good for defense uh, did you participate in that training i was just an observer okay so in the time that you saw her doing armor duties um you you didn't have any complaints about her no okay now, Mr. Halls, you know that she was also doing props duties. Did you ever witness her doing specific props duties like rolling cowboy cigarettes or propping up actors? Or... I, I recall seeing her helping in, in propping up actors, yes. Okay. Now, we, uh, we saw some videos earlier today of, of some of the scenes, and it looked like there was fairly... Um, gun heavy scenes at times uh, and so there would be a lot of people walking around some people holding weapons you recall that yes there, there were yes okay now there, there were a couple instances where it appeared that muzzles were getting of, of weapons were getting traced across people um, now do you recall anything like that can you clarify sure my, there was my... some tech testimony but and, and some videos where for example a stunt man was holding a, a weapon and he was kind of turning around and and it was coming across the muzzle across other people mm -hmm. do you recall anything like that i don't recall anything okay. mm -hmm. um some of those it, it appeared you were present on the videos but you do you remember any instances where you felt like there was an unsafe condition with the way people were pointing their muzzles. I, I did not. I did not. Again, he's relying on his memory when what he could do is bring the evidence, which has already been admitted in evidence, put it in front of him and ask him, what do you think about the safety on this thing? You were there for it. You know, uh, you were, you were present. Now you're looking at it again. What, what do you say about the safety on this? Although that's kind of a double-edged sword for the defense because um, if he says, oh, that doesn't look so bad or like, oh, I don't know so much. I don't, I don't know. I mean, it, that could also backfire in, in a number of ways. No. If, if I did, uh, it was part of my practice that 
I always, uh, I would say, please point the gun away. If their action as an actor was to point it at another actor, I would say, please, especially live fire situations, please make sure you're pointing the gun away from okay. that actor. So your, your habit in practice was if you saw someone like that, you would tell them, please point that gun a different direction. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Now we saw another video where it appeared uh, Mr. Baldwin was running out of a, uh, a shack or a structure and the cameras are panning over and he's shooting as he's coming out of it. Mm -hmm. And there's a camera and it's a blank. They're shooting blanks out of it. Mm -hmm. Do you recall that scene? I do. Okay. Do you recall that the cameras were sort of right in front of Mr. Baldwin as he's coming out and shooting? I do. Um, do you remember having any concerns about the safety of that shot with Mr. Baldwin shooting a blank and the camera being right there? Uh, and we're not sure how many feet away, but it was. Uh, look, there was a number of situations where whenever there was a, a camera that needed to be close to a gun being fired with a blank, I would ask the operator, do you feel safe? I would suggest that they would put a, it's, we call them fernie pads, but they're, they're basically a packing blanket that you would see when you're moving furniture or something that typically mm -hmm. people can wear in that situation. Okay, sir. So, and, and you, you had a lot of experience leading up to that movie, but when you saw something like that, you said your habit and practice was to talk to the person behind the camera. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you remember a scene where, it was actually that same scene where Mr. Baldwin ran up the hill with the child actor at mm -hmm. the end of that scene. And there was a yell for cut. And then Mr. Baldwin shoots after the yell for cut and he cusses, utters a cuss word. Do you remember that? I, uh, I only recall it because it was shown to me during a deposition in December. Yes, sir. And I recall that was shown to you. Yes, it was. Um, now, your memory of that, did you at the time think that was a safety concern that cut had been yelled and Mr. Baldwin shot after the directive? I didn't, I did, did, didn't register as a safety concern. Okay. Did, did Mr. Baldwin uh, at times direct people on those scenes, like the camera people, the armor, did he sort of order people how he wanted to do it? Again, this is recalling what was shown to me in the deposition, uh, and he was clearly pointing pointing a gun and asking the person that he was pointing the gun at in the direction to you know please move. Okay, move move away from where he's pointing the gun. Did do you remember at times Mr. Baldwin rushing people to keep going, reload, let's go, let's go, let's go? Do you remember that? Again, I was shown a video where Mr. Baldwin says, "Let's go." I don't characterize that as Mr. Baldwin rushing people. Okay. I think I characterize it as an actor in his moment. I'm ready. Okay, let's go. There was never any Mr. Baldwin rushing anybody. Okay. So you never felt like Mr. Baldwin was, was rushing? Okay. None whatsoever. Don't okay. like that, that answer. Now, let me talk to you about you became aware of, of two negligent discharges on set, did you not? I did. And do you remember those were approximately October 16th, 2021? Approximately. Were you present uh, and witness in either of those incidents? I was. Uh, which one or both? Both. Okay. At the time that you witnessed them, do you, you know then that one involved Sarah Zachary? Yes. And the other involved a stunt double? Yes, Blake. Blake. Stunt, yeah. Okay. Um, what did you do uh, in response to each of those safety incidents? I I, I didn't do I didn't do anything. I, I when when the when Blake's long gun went off, I said, "What the f is going on in there?" And you replied, "It just went off." Okay, and so you you questioned him briefly. He said that the gun just went off. Did you ask him anything else about it? I did not. And how about with regard to Miss Zachary? I did not. Okay. Say now, you know that um, that there is a thing called a production report. I do. And a production report is something that has the daily events, anything significant that happened that day. Is that right? Yes. Would that be something that ordinarily 
would be put into a production report? I. It's such a, a rare situation. I, I, I couldn't answer you. I, I, that feels evasive. I don't think it would be a, a, a normal thing. Well, but wouldn't who, whose responsibility would it be to make the production report? Uh, it would be the second assistant director. Okay. Would you have any responsibility to report that yourself? I would. And now, would this be something that you would consider noteworthy that maybe someone up the chain would want to know about? At the time, it didn't, it, it didn't seem to be noteworthy. It was just, it, it happened. I don't know. It didn't seem to be noteworthy? Other than, don't do that again. <laughs> he seems, I, I mean, know. he's just as incompetent as, as Hannah really, is. What else could be done? Okay. If, you know, if what, we stop, call a meeting, don't, don't do that again. I, okay. That's the only did, did it ever occur to you that perhaps some additional training might have been warranted uh, for those people that had the misfires, the uh, negligent discharges? No. Why did it not occur to you that maybe they needed some more training, for example, on how to hold that hammer and prevent that from falling too quickly? To, it, why did that not occur to you? Well, if for, for the stunt doubles case, I'm assuming that he was an ex experienced stunt person that had experience with, with, with firearms. And I, I, I guess I made an assumption that uh, Sarah had some experience in training. See, I, I feel like this would play better if, if he was like, you know, at the time it didn't seem noteworthy. That's why I didn't, I didn't include it in on hindsight or in, you know, upon, upon thinking about it and reflecting on it since that time, I recognize that I should have done it. That would have played out quite a bit better, I think, to the jury. I mean, I don't know. We don't know what the jury's thinking, of course, but I just, to, to me, I, I would, I would feel like, all right, big ups to you, man. Like you, you, like you yourself have, have learned something from this. Um, but his, like between that and like, oh, you know, I didn't see any safety issues with with this and that with Alec Baldwin uh, doing the thing. It's just uh, it feels like either he didn't really know safety, gun safety, which he should have if he's in charge of all safety on set. And then like. It just seems like he just was not focused on that when when like real problems were happening with these with these negligent discharges and what did you make that assumption on that that assumption experience just okay so uh in response to those negligent discharges there's nothing that nothing that happens now did you become aware of another discharge by special effects. No, Were you aware of that? No. Okay. No, no. Did you, um, are you aware of the safety bulletins put out by SAG? Oh, I am. And did you ever know that they were, or whether they were attached to the call sheets? They were, they were not. Do you know, who would attach those? Would that be you? If they were going to be attached, it would it would be my a member of my department that would do it. Do you know why those safety bulletins were not attached? It's not a requirement re requirement. Okay. Some some eighty departments do it. Some some don't. Now the safety bulletin goes over the rules about firearm safety, doesn't it? Yes. And so that's something that, but you're saying that, that that just varies, that some people do it, some don't? Yes. Okay. You talked earlier about when you would make an announcement that there would be uh, gun usage or, or live fire with blanks, you had a wireless microphone? I did. Um, well, how did that work? Would, would that transmit through a radio 
or to other people, or you would just announce it on the microphone? Often I would do it simultaneously push. I would have a, uh, a little microphone lapel, you know, it would be up, up here. That's normally how I would, I would communicate. It was never, no, no, I usually would do it by hand with the walkie talkie. And I would, uh, there were times where I would do it simultaneously with the wireless microphone in my, in my walkie talkie. So if you, uh, that wireless microphone, would it just transmit into the general area around you? It, yes. And then if you, so if you do that at the same time as your walkie talkie, um, did that effectively communicate through your radio with your microphone? I mean, did that have any issues with that? No, 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 that I'm aware of. Okay. Now, what channel, I know there was different channels, and I said, what channel would you normally communicate those uh, announcements on? Channel one. Channel one. And do you know whether the armors were always on channel one or if they had a different channel? They better have been. Well, and I'm not saying any given time. I'm not talking about a given moment at this point. I'm just asking you, did the armors have another channel? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. It's, sometimes the departments might designate another channel to go to for a, a private conversation. Typically, channel two is de de devoted just to if there's a longer conversation that needs to happen people can, can, can go to channel two. Okay. And then uh, props, do they have their own channel? They're on channel one. Okay. Channel one is, is props. Okay. Yes. Um, on the day in question, on the 21st, you knew that Video Village was down? Yes. And, and can That's, you tell, I'm sorry, go yeah, ahead. Yeah. That, okay. Can you tell the jury a little bit more about Video Village just so they understand it? Where was this set up? Video Village is it is basically what you a pop up tent that you would see at a party or an event. Uh, what are they ten by ten or something like that? Um, and then the sides would be blacked out so that no daylight could get into 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 this this what is the video village where there's a monitor in this case it was a it was a large monitor um, I don't, for 42 inches led flat screen monitor and then and then that video village in uh, in the industry that is re referring to this place that the the director of photography the director producers the script supervisor can can see the action, can see the shot being filmed on this on this monitor. Now, ordinarily, if that were set up on that day, uh, Miss Hutchins and Mr. Souza would have been in that tent watching Video Village. Is that right, sir? That's yeah. Okay, that's my feeling. Yeah. And because the uh, camera crew had walked out, or uh, the next day, Video Village is not operational. Is that right? That's my understanding. Yes. Okay. And is that why ultimately there was um, kind of a change and people were inside the church? That's my understanding of it, yes. Um, did you know on the day, uh, on the 21st, that things were a couple hours behind? Very well aware of it. Yes, sir. And I know. Um, did that camera crew that walked off, did they come back that next day? The camera crew that walked off the day before, did they come back the next day? They 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 came back. I I saw them there that morning to retrieve I, I with some of their personal items, I would think. Yeah. Were you able to meet with the new camera crew that came that day? N not until they first appeared on set with the with the with the camera. It took a while for them to get get the camera built and right. to and to set. So this is literally, they're coming on that morning and they're building a camera into set. Yes, sir. Okay. Now, once they get that set up, things start rolling. Um, before lunch, you described that you're in the church with Mr. Baldwin. Is that right? There's other people in there, but you're, you're in that church with Mr. Baldwin? Yes. Yes. Now, I think you said at some point, Miss Gutierrez-Reed came in the church and she presented the the revolver, is that right? We're talking about after lunch? No, this is before lunch. 
Y yes, we did some scenes with Mr. Baldwin and the, the actor that was portraying his grandson. Okay. Yeah. That was before lunch. That was before lunch. Did did Miss Gutierrez Reed bring that yes. that revolver before lunch? Yes. And and was that when you said that she showed it to you and it was it was empty? That was one of the occasions on that day that she showed me that the gun was empty. Yes. Okay, so that was one of the occasions. What was the other occasion that she showed you it was empty? After lunch. Okay. So we start off before lunch and the revolver is empty. Now, is he doing the same, Mr. Baldwin doing the same blocking scene? It is not my recollection. I don't recall him doing that. Okay. That scene. So it's a different type of scene, but in any event, there's an empty firearm. There's no lo rounds loaded in that. Is that right? That's correct. Was there any reason why a rubber uh, or a replica gun wasn't used? Is there any reason why a replica? Because it would look like a rubber gun. Well, was it a rehearsal or actual filming? Uh, it, it, w at what time Be period are we talking about, sir? Before lunch. Um. I just I recall just the dialogue scene between Mr. Baldwin and the actor, actor playing his grandson, and there was it was just the gun in his holster. Okay. Do you not recall him, Mr. Baldwin, pulling that out before lunch? I don't recall that before lunch. Okay. Um. Well, after lunch, you said that Mr. Miss Gutierrez Reed brought the firearm back again. And you said initially, you're saying that it was unloaded again. Yes. Um, did she again show you the barrels and, and check that gun with you? I'm sorry. Uh, um, after lunch? Yes. Yes. She present, She held the gun. Let's do this. the gun check. Just checked the barrel. Did a full rotation of the, of the drum of the cylinder. Okay. How and then what? And then I think you said after that she walked over a few steps. And what you're saying is she handed the firearm to Mr. Baldwin. Is that That's right? correct. Now, you then say that you don't see her leave, right? I I recall seeing her walk past me. She gives the gun to Mr. Baldwin, turns and walks away. Where does she walk away to? Did she see? walked. Walked past me. I didn't see where she went. You did not see her leave the church, though. Did I you? did. I did not. But then you also testified that uh, at some point she's back beside you with the firearm again, and it's got rounds in. Is that right? She told me that she put dummy rounds in. So, uh, would you, when you were near Mr. Baldwin, that church uh, does it have one entrance? I, I believe so. Yeah, I, I think it's only there might be a, a door that I didn't see in the back in the back where the altar would be, but certainly at the front of the church. Front of the church. Yeah. So, and how big is that church? Oh, twenty by 30, 20. So approximately six hundred square feet, roughly. I'll let you do that math, Mr. Bowles. I, I mean, I could be wrong, but I, I think it's about 600 square feet. So within that, it would be, the width would be from pretty much from here to, to that wall. And then where that, uh, where we enter. Okay. So for the record, you're pointing with your left hand to the side of the judge's desk to her honor's desk and the wall on the mm -hmm. other side. Mm -hmm. And then you, from where you're seated to, Right behind council? Yes. Okay, where you come in. Okay. So that's about the size of the church. Now, you are sitting there fairly close to Mr. Baldwin, right? Yes, I was. Okay. Stand, then, standing there. And then you say you don't see Miss Gutierrez leave at all. Miss Gutierrez Reed leave. And then she comes back with a firearm again. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Now, you then state that she shows you what you believe are three or four rounds 
in the firearm? Yes, sir. And did she do that by, how did she do that? I, I don't know if she did a full rotation. I don't recall a full rotation. And my recollection is seeing three to four rounds. So if she had done a full rotation, you would have seen every cylinder in that, right? In retrospect, I would like to think I would have. Yes. Okay. Um, because after, um, after everything happens, we know that you said it's unloaded and there's five dummies in one casing. So that's six, right? Yeah. Okay. So is it possible that you did, you did see every cylinder or, or how do you reconcile that? There's three or four rounds before, but there's six rounds after. Because there was not a, f a full rotation of the cylinder to show me six rounds. Again, my recollection is only seeing three, three to four. But you don't recall whether that was a full rotation or not. I don't recall if it was a full rotation or not. Yeah. Now that, if that had not been, um, that would not be a full weapons check with you, correct? I have, yes, I have stated that, yes. Okay, but yet you testified earlier, every time before this, since the start of the Rust filming, Ms. Gutierrez-Reed always did a complete weapons check with you. Yes. So you're saying that this time, for whatever reason, she abandoned her habit and everything she had done before, and you had praised her for doing a good job. Mm -hmm. And somehow on this occasion, you're saying that there wasn't a full rotation. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, why didn't you say something? That I'd like to see again that this is what I am admitting to that I did an improper check of that firearm. And so after you admit admittedly do an improper check of the firearm, isn't it true that you handed that firearm to Mr. Baldwin? It's not true. Do you know that your account conflicts with Mr. Baldwin's? I am aware of that. Yeah, it does. And do you know that it conflicts with Ms. Gutierrez Reed? I am aware of that, but I, however, there, in, in Mr. Baldwin's initial statement with uh, Detective Hancock, um, hours, a few hours after the incident on October 21st, when asked the question, who handed him the gun? He said, Hannah did, like she always did. And and after that, he changed and said you had handed it to him, right? Yeah, he has. Okay. Right after this happened, the um, shooting happened. Do you remember you were standing outside with Mr. Baldwin talking with him, kind of near a truck? Yes, I do. Do you recall what you all were talking about? Were you talking about the events and kind of how this could have happened? And yeah, yes. So you were kind of discussing and uh, kind of trying to remember with each other what had occurred. Is that fair? The, the, most of the discussion was what could have, what was it that entered their bodies? Oh, that's helpful to the defense because they're saying Alec Baldwin was not separated from other people. Therefore, he had an ability to line up his story with other people's stories. You know, this is why you don't want people talking to each other. This is exactly what the defense is talking about, which is, yeah, they were like, what could have happened? Both of them talking about it and agreeing on it. That is kind of the definition of like lining up a, a narrative or a story as to as to, you know, what happened. And I think to, to a person that that was sequestered, that was that was the tone of the discussion. And certainly the, the discussions that I had with Mr. Ball, where we were both, you know, was it a blank? Was it yeah, just th that idea of a live round again? being on a film set was just uncomputable. It, it was, was it inconceivable that there would be a live round on set? Yes. And in fact, I mean, did you ever dream that there, there would be a live round? And you're thinking, talking to Mr. Ball, well, not, did you have any thought of that? Uh, honestly, no. Okay. 
Now, after you all talked, Mr. Bubble and you, did you talk with him again uh, after the shooting and after that day, the 21st? No. Okay. If at the moment that this had happened, I know you indicate that Ms. Gutierrez Reed gave him a firearm, but if you had provided him the firearm, which you're denying, I know, you're saying that didn't happen. If that had happened, and Ms. Gutierrez Reed were not in the church at that moment, that would have been your responsibility under the safety bulletin to ensure the safe operation, right? Can you state that again, clarify? Yeah, that, was pretty, that was pretty long. Under the safety bulletin, if the property master and armor are not present during a gun scene, and you are the person there, do you agree with me that the responsibility would then fall on the first assistant director in a general scene for safety? I don't recall any seeing any language about the assistant director taking responsibility for the firearm if there is a prop master or, or uh, armor not present. But he is kind of in charge of all safety, and that includes firearms. Okay, sir, do you recall uh, giving a deposition in this matter? Yes. Okay. And if I can just, before I get into that, I just want to kind of give you a few more details, see if you remember that under the safety advisory bulletin, that the first assistant director becomes the person responsible for maintaining and handling weapons if the property master and armor are not present. Do you recall that? I, I don't recall that language. Okay. If, if you're saying it's there, I mean, and okay. you can, yeah. It, well, do you recall being at in this on page 121 at line six? Uh, if you had known that Hannah, um, had you known that she wasn't in the church, meaning Hannah, under this guideline, would you perhaps be the individual responsible for maintaining and handling weapons? And your answer. If I knew that she was to be leaving the church, yes, it would. And knowing that the gun was cold, as I believed it to be, as she believed it to be, as Mr. Baldwin was told it was to be, yes, I would be that person. I have worked in productions where an actor would have a gun. Do, do you remember that portion? Yeah, yes. Okay. And there's one more portion you gave just for completeness. And you know, maybe the actor wasn't necessarily in set. And the prop master who was handling the guns because there was no live fire, again, it's a prop. So the prop master is responsible for these guns. He would often say, not often, but there have been a couple of occasions where I have to go, go to my cart, get something. Can you watch the gun? And I would watch the gun. Do you recall giving that answer, sir? I do. Okay. And does that refresh your memory that if you know that they're not present, that sometimes you're res you may be responsible? If I knew that they were not present, yes, I would, I would be, I guess, the, the next one in line to be responsible, yeah. Okay. And so um, your testimony is that you did not know that Hannah had left the church. So um, my question was, if that had occurred, if she had left the church and you had provided the gun to Baldwin, would you have been responsible? And I think what she said, you didn't know she left the church. Is that right? I did not know that she left the church. Okay. Do you recall um, checking that weapon? Regardless of who handed it to Mr. Balwa, do you recall checking that weapon again by yourself? I, I never checked that gun by myself. Okay. Do you recall whether Mr. Baldwin checked that gun? I do not recall. Okay. Was it, had you seen Mr. Baldwin retrieve a firearm before from Ms. Gutierrez-Reed on another day? Yes. Uh, when you saw him before, did he check the weapon? I don't recall. Okay. Regarding uh, when you and Ms. Gutierrez-Reed unloaded that firearm, the revolver? Mm-hmm. Uh, you walked down, I think he said you went to a cart on the left side of the church. Mm -hmm. so, do you remember that? Yes, I do. Okay. Now, do you recall that the prop cart at that point was near the black tent? 
or where that prop cart was? Do, you have... do I recall where the cart was? Yes. Yes. Where? Left hand side, if you're standing in front of the church, looking at the front door, left hand side, immediately around the corner. So if the front of the church is facing north, the left hand side of the church would be facing east. It was just right directly right around the corner. Yeah. Do you, now, do you recall that prop cart moved at some point after the police had arrived? After the police arrived? Yes. Y yes, I have a recollection of it being in a different location. Did you ever see Miss uh, Zachary, Sarah Zachary, over by the prop cart after the shooting? She was present when I asked... Uh, Hand it to uh, unload the gun, yes. Did you see whether she was inspecting anything on the cart or touching any of the items on the cart? I don't have a recollection of her seeing her touch anything, but I do have a rec recollection of her making a comment that some of them don't, don't shake. Okay, so if she made that comment, then she must have been checking and Shaking the rounds, right? I would assume so. Yeah. Okay. Did you witness that? I did not see her actually shaking any rounds. Okay. Did you see any other <clears throat> persons uh, at that moment near the cart or at the cart? No. I... Okay. I I think I I I do remember Johnny. Can't pronounce his last name. Um, Ziella. He was. But behind us, yeah, I have a recollection of him being there. Was that Johnny Zello? Yeah. Okay. Um, so he was there with you uh, at the at or, or near the cart? Near the cart, yeah. Okay. I believe it was behind me. I, I, mean, I, I just have a recollection of seeing seeing him there. Okay. After the firearm, the revolver was unloaded. Did you get those rounds? You personally? No, I never touched the, those rounds. Okay. Do you remember whether Miss uh, Gutierrez Reed ever gave those to you after? She did not give them to me. Where did where did those rounds? Did she have them? I I, I just saw them as she unloaded the gun. They fell onto the cart, and that's my recollection of, of what, what ended up with those rounds. Okay, and did you see anybody pick those up? I did not. Okay. Now, in this case, you indicated you had pled no contest, right? Yes. And you pled to a misdemeanor offense? Yes, sir. And and you said that was negligent use of a firearm, correct? Yes, sir. You you received a sentence of six months unsupervised probation, is that right? Yes, sir. So under the unsupervised probation, you did not have to report to a probation officer? I did not. And there was no conditions except not violating any laws, right? I had to take a firearm safety class. Okay. Uh, did you complete that firearm safety course? I did. And so now you're you're off probation, and that's that's it, right? For... I'm just going to check the relevance. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Judge. Rich. Relevance? I mean, it, it was brought up on, on his uh, direct examination. So, I mean, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. And it is also relevant. It's relevant to the defense argument that, that Hannah Gutierrez-Reed is taking the fall for, for other people's mistakes. If he's getting a super light sentence, or not sentence, but, you know, like a super sweet deal in comparison, and she's looking at 18 months, three years max because of the two different charges... All right, Your Honor, may I have just a moment? Thank you. Oh, I guess he lost on that objection. Um, yeah, Cat loved Jeremy and Peach. Yeah, both sides. They're not allowed to do speaking objections, which is what they've been doing this whole time. Um, they can only state that they have an objection and then approach because yesterday got way out of hand and the judge was like, Nope, not anymore.
One other question did when Ms. Gutierrez Reed was uh, present in your presence, did you ever hear her call out blank sizes, for example, if they were going to be used a quarter load or a half load or I do. Okay. And was she good about doing that? Yes. Okay. Thank you. All right. Redirect. John O'Rourke, thanks so much for the super chat. Does Hall's admitting fault help Hannah Gutierrez? The order of procedures were messed up and never happened properly from A to Z. And HG was item A. It seems like him, he admitted fault, but HG won't is worrisome. Thought scratches. Um, I will I will give Indy some scratches as well. Um, yeah, I, I I think to some extent it could help. To some extent it really hurts her because He's the one that was like, okay, I'm going to plead no contest. I'm a, I'm admitting fault. I'm admitting my part. Um, the parts that it maybe helps her is that the guy who's supposed to be overseeing things on top, like over her, doesn't seem to know much about gun safety, like at all. And he took a gun safety class after the fact. So maybe now he knows a little bit about gun safety, but didn't, didn't seem to know all that much beforehand. And then also seemed to be making excuses for Alec Baldwin rushing people when the jury has seen that video themselves of, of him saying, go, 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 reload, 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 and the, the way in which he did it. So, you know, maybe there are some jurors that will agree with him and say, you know, like that was just an actor being in the moment, being in his feelings. Um, and then maybe others will be like, hell no, he was barking orders at those people. And he's like, not seeing that. What is like, what else happened on set that he interpreted that way? That was actually not like that at all. He was barking orders at people and rushing people through safety procedures, especially because also that contradicts what the what the defense expert said, the armorer expert, who was like, yeah, this is an example of when an actor is trying to rush people on set and when the armorer needs to slow things down. So, um, you know, so 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 David Hall's his interpretation of that particular moment is not consistent with the armorer expert, who is the state's expert. Um, and I think that's that's harmful to his own credibility in terms of his overall role and how he perceived the safety, generally speaking, on set there and his level of responsiveness to people's concerns over safety. Because he did acknowledge that somebody emailed over over safety concerns, the fact that they wanted to have safety meetings. And he's like, yeah, we didn't have safety meetings every day. And people did email about it and like, Meh, OK, well, too bad. Two negligent discharges. Well, I didn't think that they were really that that uh, that important basically um it, he didn't exactly say important he used another word but basically meaning the same thing all of that kind of kind of states like sh a, a juror could also look at all of that and say you know i don't think hannah gutierrez reed as the armorer on set had the support that she needed within like the overall like like safety department to to have someone have her back to help her do her job so that she could maintain safety with those firearms. So, so there could be jurors on set that look at all of that and say, like, how can I hold her responsible for for something like involuntary manslaughter when this guy had arguably even more responsibility because he was overseeing all of that, and he doesn't seem to understand any of the safety stuff, and still doesn't seem to see the problem with what happened there and how just how dangerous that was, even after the fact. He's not like you know, reflecting on it and, and changing his, his thoughts on it. So, so, um, I was not noteworthy. The discharges were not noteworthy. Thank you. Um, so, so those, those things, those aspects of his testimony really could help Hannah here. It, if the jurors interpret it that way, well, we'll, we'll see. Okay. Let's get to redirect. Sir. The, um, I want to talk to you about the, the other instance that you recall where dummy rounds were used. Uh, I think you indicated they were in a rifle. Yes. Um, did you request dummy rounds be placed in the rifle? No. Did anyone else that you're aware of request? I'm, I'm not aware of anyone else that okay. requested the okay. dummy rounds. Um, do you know why dummy rounds are used in revolvers? Yes. Why is that? 
Well, if if the if the shot is is close up enough on on the revolver, one, I uh, I don't think you need necessarily need to have experience with a firearm, but one could detect that there that gun is not loaded with any with any rounds. So that's the the, the reason why we use dummy rounds, cosmetic. Because if, if the revolver is pointed at me, the dummies are in there so that you can see the projectiles inside the cylinder, right? Correct. Is that the same way that a rifle is set up? Uh, no, but in, in this case, in just from recollection, I think it, the, there, was, there was something about that long gun that you could see that that the, the rounds would be loaded if this was the barrel of the gun that the, the rounds would be loaded somewhere and it would be visible then to the best of your recollection was there actually filming of a scene that would show that part of that rifle was there actually uh, it's only my speculation that there was it was a shot that was close up on uh, on that close up enough on that long gun that Hannah made a decision that, you know, to make this look correct, that dummy round should be in this. Is in that this your game. recollection or is that your assumption? She told me that she, and I saw her load, load the dummy rounds into the, the long gun. Okay. But my question for you is dummy rounds are put in guns because you're going to roll film, right? Yes. Do you have a specific recollection of there being a video take of that rifle being loaded or unloaded or cycling? No. Okay. I don't have recollection. Okay. Thank you, sir. I, um, I have, there's no recollection of, of a shot of that rifle being loaded. Okay. Um, the entire time that you worked with Ms. Gutierrez on the set of Rust, do you have any recollection of ever seeing her shake a dummy round? I do not. That's interesting. Uh, on cross-examination, well, also on direct, you testified that the dummy rounds that you saw come out of the revolver after the incident had shiny brass primers. Is that right? Do well, you... if you want to get technical, right, it's it, it would be the end of the casing, which would have the primer in the center okay. of, of this of that surface that's bright okay. brass. Yes. You understand what the primer of, of, of the casing is, correct? I do. Um, and your recollection is that the dummy rounds that were taken out of the gun had brass, shiny brass primers, right? Yes. And do you agree with me that States Exhibit 26, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy to come closer to you. It, well, if you could, just okay. to free. Well, let's do that. Let just me bring them up on the screen, Dan. I don't like this. I don't, I don't yes. like this bringing up the laptop to them. I, I want, like, everyone in the courtroom should be able to see this. Is that a shiny brass primer? Uh, honestly, my recollection is that they were, they were a little bit more shinier than what you're showing me. Well, hang on. Is that close enough for you? And I know yeah. I have old eyes also, so I sympathize with you. I'm sorry. Um, Are you calling me old? Um, I, <laughs> I am. I am. <laughs> That's why. Um, um, is that primer brass? That, that primer does not appear to be brass. Okay. Thank you, sir. And, and let me ask you, when was the last time well, you saw a spent casing come out of that revolver? Correct? I did. I did. When was the last time you saw that spent casing? At, at the moment when I asked her to unlock the, the gun. On October 21st, 2021. Yes. Sorry. I just want to clear up a, a, a point that on cross-examination, I was a little confused about. 
you indicated um, that Mr. Baldwin initially said that Hannah handed him the gun and then changed his story. Yes. Um, did he change his story, if you recall, during the interview with Detective Hancock on the 21st? No. Did he change it after that? Yes. Okay. Do you know when the first time was that you realized that he had a different version of events? It was shortly after when Miss Gateria, Ms. G when Hannah said that, made a statement that she had, give, that I gave the gun to Baldwin. I'm just wondering when that would have been. I don't, I don't know. It was months, maybe. Months, months after, after October. I, I believe so, yeah. Okay. There's something about that that seems like it was painful for him to say, like he was angry about it. Uh, Mr. Bowles asked you about the safety bulletins and that when the armorer isn't present, that the uh, first assistant director is kind of in charge of guns, right? Yes. Is it your understanding that that safety bulletin contemplates the first assistant director being told that the armorer is going to leave the area? Yeah, that I don't. That's not in, in that document. How are you supposed to know that she's left if you're not told that she's left? You're correct. Eyeballs? Looking I, around the room? I only know that she's left if she's telling me she's leaving or if I see her leave. Okay. Um, and as first assistant director, you have a lot of other responsibilities other than checking the gun and keeping, keeping an eye on the armor, don't you? I do. Okay. I'm sorry. Did, did you withdraw your objection? Uh, he's already answered. So. Okay. Okay. Uh, and I don't have anything further. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Woo. All right. Thank you. You're excused. Yeah. Who is next? All right. Next witness. State calls Sarah Zachary. Oh, Sarah Zachary. <clears throat> So Sarah Zachary is, uh, she was the prop master. She was the one who was technically Hannah's boss. I firm under penalty of law. I didn't the really know anything about her. This case will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Okay, you're going to have to speak up, yeah. talk into the microphone, and have a seat. I want you to move that microphone closer to you. Thank you. Will you state your name for the record? Sarah Zachary. All right. Oh, she's nervous. Understandably. Um, Ms. Zachary, in 2021, uh, were you doing work in the film industry? Yes. Are you still doing work in the film industry? No. Mm. Why not? After arrest, I didn't want to work in it anymore. Okay. Um, prior... Uh, what, do, were you employed on the set of the movie Rust? Yes. In what capacity? I was the prop master. And briefly, what does a prop master do? A prop master is responsible for sourcing and providing production with anything that an actor interacts with during the time of filming. Oh, she's about to cry. It's so like when you say anything that an actor interacts with, um, does that include firearms? It does. Uh, does it include hand sanitizer? If the actor is touching it, then yes. Okay. A bowl of soup? If the actor is touching it. Okay. Any of those things? Any. Tables, chairs? Uh, that would be set deck. Okay. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Anything that they hold. Okay. Uh, really quick here. Um, did Sarah take an immunity agreement? I don't know if she was offered immunity for this testimony. Uh, that's, that's something that I just, I don't, I don't know if, um, if there's anybody in the chat that knows, feel free to, to let us know. Um, what was your experience in the film industry before you began work on the set of rest? Um, I began in, uh, the art department as set deck 
And then um, on one production, I was supposed to be in costumes, but then I became a prop master uh, when the original prop master couldn't uh, work on it anymore. So I had to learn on the job how to do that. And that's what I pro uh, what job I progressed with uh, throughout my career in film. What is set deck? Set deck, it just means that you're decorating the set. How many films did you work on in any capacity? Oh. Possibly like five or six. And can you tell the uh, ladies and gentlemen of the jury who Seth Kenny is? Seth Kenny was the vendor for the firearms and ammunition on the set of Rust. Did you know Mr. Kenny prior to your work on the set of Rust? Yes, he was a vendor for a previous film that I did before Rust. Um, how long had you known him before Rust? A couple of months. And did you did you ever take on a, a small armor role? I did. On another um, film, when I was the prop master, they couldn't find a armor for that set. So they just told me right away that I was going to be the armor. Oh, Jesus. Um, and who's they? Are you talking about production? Production producers. So let me be clear. Do you own guns? No. Holy crap. Have you ever shot a gun? No. What kind of training, if any, did you receive before another film made you armor? I was recommended on a separate film um, to uh, get in touch with Seth Kenny, and he was the one who trained me to use these specific guns on um, on that set. Thank you, as well as trained me how to load and unload those weapons, how to call out um, uh, different cues. Weapons. Oh my God. Mm, that's about it. So that makes me think that if Hannah had decided to walk off set and just quit instead of continuing through the Rust production, I wonder if the producers would have turned to Sarah and been like, all right, your armor now, help us out. And then she would have been the one liable for, you know, she would have been the one charged in, in Hannah's place. Like that's kind of how I feel with that bit of information. Um, how long was that training? Did it take days, hours? A few days. And were you trained on single action revolvers for that film? Uh, just one. Yes. It was a revolver? It was a revolver. Was it a single action revolver? That I'm not sure. Okay. Um, that production that you were the armorer on, is that a production that had um, lots of gunfight scenes? No. How busy was that movie in terms of armorer duties? I mean, we had the guns on set every day, but in terms of actually utilizing those guns with things such as blanks or dummies, maybe two, three days. Okay. And have you, prior to Rust, is that the sum total of the uh, experience you've had with firearms? Yes. So how do you end up being the prop master on Rust. Do you apply for a job? What happens? Uh, a lot of it is word of mouth uh, when it comes to the industry, but uh, Seth Kenny was the one who uh, asked me if I wanted to work on it, and he said that he had sent my resume to um, the line producer. And were you interested in working on it? I was. And at some point in time, did you understand that you were going to be working with an armorer? Yes, Seth Kenny said that he had an armorer in mind. 
And did that person turn out to be Ms. Gutierrez? Yes. Did we understand from some of the previous testimony that although you were the prop master, you were also loading and unloading some of the firearms. Is that right? Correct. Um, how did you go from prop master to handling firearms? So originally there was supposed to um, be a separate uh, armor's assistant, but product production had only allotted for five days and that was not going to be enough uh, because of how, um, how many gunfights we had uh, that we read through the script. So instead it was recommended that I help out since I was already going to be on set. And so did you receive any training from Ms. Gutierrez uh, so that you would be able to competently load and unload the guns? Briefly, yes. When you say briefly, how much training did you receive from Ms. Gutierrez? A few minutes. Boom. And had you, and let me try to back up. When I say single action revolver, do you know what I'm talking about? Not quite, no. Okay. So the, let me ask you this, on the previous movie set that you were working on as the armorer, you said there was a revolver. Correct. Uh, was that the kind of revolver where the barrel would completely come out and away from the gun for you to load and unload it? Yes, the cylinder came out on the side. Yes. The cylinder's kind of, the entire thing flops out. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, and were was that the same style of revolver as what you were using on the set of Rust? No. What was the difference? The difference mainly was the way that you would load and unload it. Um, part of that maneuver was pulling back the hammer and the trigger at the same time, and then slowly releasing both of those to lock it back in place. Okay. It, and that was something that was very new to you. Is that right? Correct. The first time you'd ever done that was on the set of rust. Yes. And you got 10 minutes of training. About, yes. Um, we understand at some point that there were some accidental discharges on the set. Do you recall those? Correct. Yeah. Um, Negligent did one of them involve discharges. you? Yes. Uh, can you just explain to the jury what the circumstances were of that accidental hmm. discharge? Yes. Negligent discharge. Um, so we had a gunfight between a few different actors where I was helping to load blanks and um, and when we were going in for another take I had to unload the blanks that were already discharged and fill them fill the gun with new ones and as I was uh, loading them and locking the gun back into place uh, the hammer slipped from my thumb and one of the rounds went off there is no projectile so it was just a um, loud pop in a flash. Did that incident, well, well, let me ask you this. If you recall, do you recall where Ms. Gutierrez was, the reason that you were doing it and not her? I believe at that point she was in the bathroom. And did that incident create any kind of a conflict between you and Ms. Gutierrez? She just didn't know if I would be capable to work uh, with guns anymore after that, even though I had cleared everything that happened on set. I apologized to everyone. I messaged the people I need to to let them know what happened. Um, but I mean, there was just a little bit of disagreement, but then we moved on. Okay. Um, who did you message to notify people of what happened? I messaged Seth, Kenny, Ro Walters, um, and the production designer, Brian Norvell. And 
Was Brian Norvell kind of a supervisor of yours? I would say so. That's what I saw him as. Okay. Um, you have previously been referred to as being Hannah Gutierrez's boss. Mm -hmm. uh, were you Hannah's boss? Not that I was aware of. Um, okay. In terms of firearms and firearm safety on set, whose job was that? The armors. But that uh, the the armorer expert disagrees with that. He said that the prop master is higher up over over the uh, over the armor. Not in terms of like responsibility for safety. It is the armorer has distinct responsibility for safety. But but to say if she was like I wasn't aware that I was her supervisor. I mean that just again to me it, it strikes incompetence in her own role. She doesn't know who she's who she's supposed to be in charge of, who's supposed to be in charge of her. What is she supposed to do? Oh, good Lord. Election on approximately how many occasions, um, well, let me back up. Uh, did you aid in loading guns and gun belts with dummy rounds guns yes the gun belts already had dummy rounds in them okay let's talk about that so in terms of the props the gun belt props um for this movie um do you recall who sourced those where did they come from as far as I know, Hannah brought them from a different set. From another movie she'd worked on? Correct. Um, did you see them? Yes. And when they arrived on set, um, were they empty or did you did they have to be loaded with dummies? They only had to have a, a couple at most put them in them because they were lost, fell out. Okay, uh, but the gun belts that Ms. Gutierrez provided were already loaded with dummies when she brought them on set. Is that your understanding? That's my understanding, yes. And that's your recollection? Yes. And you saw them? Yes. So when, when she brought them on set and they were already loaded with dummies, uh, did you take the time to remove every dummy and shake them? No. Um, did you see her take the time to remove every dummy from the belts and shake them? No. Did you see anyone? No. Because you guys had another assistant uh, for a little while, uh, Ms. Montoya, is that right? Correct. Uh, and did Ms. Montoya, you never saw her do that with those? That wasn't her job, no. Okay. Um, so Do you begin working on the movie on the first day of filming? Uh, no, we have uh, prep days where we go through the script and prepare um, everything that we need to start production. Do you recall the day that filming began? October 6th. And how? when would you have begun work on this movie? I was contacted on September 23rd. And I had about uh, until until September or October 6 to prep for that. Um, because you are the prop master, were you did you participate in getting guns and ammunition um, from the vendor to the movie set? Yes. Um, where did who who was the vendor for the guns? Where did the guns come from? Seth Kenny. And what's the name of the company that he owns? Um, PDU Props and Arms. And what about the blank ammunition? Um, who who provided that? Seth Kenny. Um, in terms of the dummy ammunition. Can you explain to the jury what the situation was with 
dummy availability at the beginning of the movie? We had, uh, I mean, Seth Kenny and a, another vendor named Billy Ray had provided a few boxes of dummy rounds. Were those dummy rounds 45 long cold? No. Um, so at the beginning of the movie, had Seth Kinney provided... Sorry, I just realized I was muted. Um, <laughs> what I said was, I feel like I don't really trust that she knows what, what, what that is, what a 45 long Colt is, based on like the, the testimony that she's given so far about firearms. Any 45 long Colt dummies? No. At some point during filming, did Mr. Kenny provide 45 long Colt dummies? Yes. And... How were those provided? Uh, Hannah had requested for 45 long colts. And on one of our weekends, around October 12th, um, I went and picked them up from Albuquerque on one of her days off. So you picked up the first box of 45 long colt dummies from Mr. Kinney on October 12th. Correct. Was that the only bomb that Mr. Kinney ever provided? Correct. When Ms. Gutierrez brought the gun belts and they already had the dummy rounds in them, if you recall, did she also have boxes of dummy rounds? Um, I don't remember what she provided. Okay. You, you just don't recall? I just don't remember. Okay. Um, was there was there an issue with the forty five long Colt dummies? Were, were you struggling? Did you guys not have enough? Uh, as far as I was concerned, Hannah just had requested them. I felt like we had plenty to work with, but she said that they just didn't. The ones that we did have just didn't fit quite as right. Okay. Um, in terms of the the dummy rounds, the time during the time that you were working on Rust, who was the person in the position to make a decision about whether or not to use dummies? Hannah. Was there ever a time that you heard anyone else, a crew member or a cast member, uh, request that dummies be put in a gun? No. During the time that you were working with Ms. Gutierrez on Rust, approximately how many times that you're aware of were guns dummied up were dummies put in guns i don't recall a handful of times maybe a handful of times yeah okay um did you participate uh, do, were you handling the dummies yes a and why were you handling the dummies it was usually if there were two or more guns on set to move things along because i was also acting as an assistant for her when okay. it came to the weapons Okay, so you're the prop master. Technically, she's kind of under you, but you were also sort of her assistant. Correct. Okay, um, so with, with regard to your handling of dummy rounds on set, wh where were they? How, how would you get them? Did you get them from Ms. Gutierrez or, or did you have access to them? I had access to them. And, and where? Uh Real quick, X Files Inc. Thanks for the super chat. Did Sarah have charges? No, but apparently she got immunity. Where were they located? Um, originally in on the prop truck, and then, uh, as far as I know, we brought them on the cart when we needed them. Okay. Um, when you loaded a gun with dummies, 
what did you do to make sure that the rounds were dummy rounds and not live rounds? Rattle them. Did all of the dummy rounds that you handled, did they all rattle? Yes. Were there any dummy rounds on set that had holes in them? Yes. And did you ever handle any of those? No. Did you ever see Ms. Gutierrez load dummy rounds into any of the revolvers? I wasn't paying attention to her loading them. You weren't paying attention? No. Well, let me ask you this. Did you load the revolvers with all the dummy rounds or was that something she did also? She did them as well. Okay. Um, in the entire time that you worked with Ms. Gutierrez on the set of Rust, do you have any recollection of a single time that you saw her rattle a dummy? I can't recall. You don't recall ever seeing her do that? No. Okay. And does that mean she may have and you just didn't see it? Correct. Were you guys working pretty closely together? Yes. Um, and you don't recall ever seeing her do that? Not that I can remember. Okay. Now, do you recall Gary, that is what he said. any time that dummy rounds were loaded into a uh, a lever action rifle. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yes. You know the rifle I'm talking about? I am. Okay. Do you recall uh, an occasion when dummy rounds were loaded into that rifle? I remember blanks, but not dummy rounds. Okay. Um, did, did you ever load blanks or dummies into that rifle? No. Did you ever load blanks or dummies into the revolver that was Mr. Baldwin's prop? No. And, and why not? Was there some kind of a division of labor agreement there? Uh, that was, it, Hannah was just working closely with Alec. And so when Alec requested the guns, he would call for Hannah. Okay. And you never loaded or unloaded it? No, not that I recall. Give me just one moment. So, to be clear, the only 45 long cult dummy rounds that you brought to the set was the one box from Seth Kenny. Correct. Um, and do you know where the other 45 long colt dummies came from? No. Um, when you were working on set, did you occasionally take photos with your cell phone? Yes. And what was the purpose of taking photos with your cell phone? Mainly for continuity. And what do you so I have a feeling this might be why they gave her immunity for her testimony is to introduce these photos because exhibits have to be introduced through a witness. And so if she's the one that took the photos, she would be the one to introduce them. So, so, so far her testimony has been not particularly helpful to the state, but if she's got some damaging photos to the defense, then they're going to want to introduce those photos through her. And like I said, that, that would probably be why, why they gave her immunity. What do you mean when you say continuity? Dur with continuity, um, during a scene, you have uh, you do several takes during the scene, and you just want to make sure that with the props that they look exactly the same throughout each take. So you want to make sure that there's continuity through um, throughout the entire scene. And I'm going to shift gears for a moment. Did you bring onto the set the dummy rounds from Billy Ray? Yes. Were those 40? Really quick follow up, uh, whoever, what couldn't they have gotten a warrant to get them off of her phone? 
100%. Um, the problem is getting them into evidence at trial. So, so like, regardless of whether that was, you know, through a warrant or she volunteered them or what have you, it doesn't matter. What matters is their, their ability to, to introduce those to the jury and, and introduce those as, as evidence. Um, and so, so you, you need to, you need to introduce them through a witness. So somebody who has familiarity with all of this. So she's the best person to, to do it since she's the one that took the photos. 45 long cold. No. And what day did you bring those onto the set? Um, I brought those ones on. Earlier, she said prior, both. prior to filming, I believe. Both Seth Kenny okay. and Billy So it Ray. would have been before October 6th. That one I can't recall. I, I don't remember what date it was. Okay. Is there anything... Do you, do you have anything that would refresh your memory? Would it refresh your memory if you looked at your phone or is that information not in there? Uh, it might be an e in an email on an invoice. That's okay. okay. All right. Um, thank you. Give me just one second. Um, Your Honor, I'm going to move for the admission of States Exhibit 162 and States Exhibit 163 and ask for permission to publish once we're connected. Any objection? No, Your Honor. All right, 162 and 163 is admitted. You may publish. So that's going to take a minute. Uh, let me get some questions in here. Bernie Chanel, do you think he knows something or wants to say something but afraid it may affect him or the trial talking about, um, uh, David Hall's uh, maybe socially could, could be, um, but not legally. Cause remember he, he did take that, that plea deal. Also John O'Rourke, thank you so much for gifting five more legal bites memberships. Very kind and generous of you. So look door, Krogan so Hobbs, publishing. Perry G, Christina Kirshner, and Susan 13. You have all been gifted memberships by John O'Rourke. So welcome or welcome back to Bike Club. Happy to have all of you guys here. And we will be doing a members only live stream this weekend, just so you know. Um, I have not mentioned that uh, before, but we're going to do it. We're going to talk more about this case in particular, maybe do some some recapage um, of, of the trial up to that point. But Saturday, um, I'm planning to do uh, a members only live stream. So, so for all of you uh, that are, that are in bike club, whether you're new or you've been there for a while, um, I hope you can join us for that. Um, what has been admitted as States Exhibit 162. Ms. Zachary, do you recognize that photo? Yes. Is that a photo that you took? Yes. On what day did you take that photo? On October 10th. And how do you know that? Um, because it is in my phone and I saw the date on it. Okay. Uh, you actually looked up the date. Yes. Is that right? So this photo was taken two days before you brought the 45 long cult dummies onto the set from Mr. Kinney. Correct. And I'm going to show you what we have marked as States Exhibit 163. Uh, do you recognize that? Yes. What is that a photo of? It is a photo of dummies in Alec Baldwin's holster rig. I think at least one and, of and those has is live. Has that also been referred to as a bandolier? Yeah. Okay. Uh, but so, so this was Mr. Baldwin's prop. This was his gun holster. Yes. Um, do you recall the date that you took this photo? October 13th. October 13th. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you recall, was Mr. Baldwin's holster a holster that was provided by Ms. Gutierrez? No. Where did that holster come from? Seth Kenny had it specially made for Alec Baldwin. 
and he shipped it out to us. And are you the person that received it? Yes. When you received it, did it already have dummy rounds loaded in it? No. Do you know who loaded the dummy rounds into Mr. Baldwin's holster that we're looking at here on 163? I don't remember specifically if okay. it was me or Hannah. But it would have been one of the two of you? Yes. Okay. Um, Ms. Zachary, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you to... October 21st of 2021. Uh, do you recall that day? Yes. Can you explain to the jurors, to the best of your recollection, what was happening on set uh, prior to the lunch hour? Uh, it was a very slow moving day because a um, few hours into that day, we had learned that the part of the crew or part of the camera crew had left production and we were working on getting a replacement team that day. So was there a delay in filming that morning? Yes. And when there is a delay in filming, what, what do you do? Are, are, are you still busy doing props? I was coordinating with, the um, art director about props for later that day, but otherwise we weren't really actively actively working. Um, and given that that there they weren't filming anything, was Ms. Gutierrez very busy? No. Ooh, that's not um, good for the defense. So, would she have had time that morning to do whatever she needed to do? Sure. And at some point, does filming begin again? Uh, yes, but I don't remember what time. Okay, would it have been before or after lunch, if you recall? We moved up to the church to a different scene. We did have one scene that we were filming that morning, um, but then sometime later uh, that morning, we moved to the church for a new scene. And as far as I remember, we only got in a rehearsal, but I, we weren't really actively working yet. Okay. Uh, and do you remember going to lunch? Yes. What happened after lunch? What were you doing after lunch? After lunch, um, we drove back in the van to set and Nicole, Hannah, and I had retrieved the guns out of the safe and returned them back to the church. Um, and then I had learned that I had forgotten a one of the guns in the safe. So I went back to retrieve it and- um, Okay, hang on. Okay. Um, were you and Hannah and Ms. Montoya um, handling any guns prior to the lunch hour? Um, to take back to the truck, yes. And then uh, the in the one scene that we did, the actors had their guns holstered. So um, When you say to take back to the truck, tell us what you mean to take back to the truck from where? So when we were breaking for lunch, we were taking the guns back from the cart uh, and locking them up in the safe on the prop truck. So the guns were used in the morning. Do you recall when the guns were used in the morning, uh, were, were dummies put in them? I don't recall that, no. And, and is that something that you think you would recall or? No, I don't remember what the scenes were okay. entirely. I don't know if it was more than one scene. Okay. Um, but guns were brought out and used in the morning session. You just don't know if they were, if they had dummies in them or not. Correct. So after lunch, the three of you go and you pull guns out of the safe. Correct. And are you all there together? 
Yes. You can see what the other person is doing. Yes. How far is the prop truck from the church? A couple a hundred yards, maybe more than that. Um, so did all three of you take guns in your hands up to the area where the church was? Yes. And when you got up there, what did you guys do with those guns, if you recall? I laid them on the prop cart. And then is that when you went back to the truck? Um, I know that I had loaded uh, Jensen Ackles gun. And when I had realized that I forgotten uh, Swen's gun, I had said that I was going to go back to the truck. Hannah said that she was going to go check Alex's gun with Dave and Nicole stayed with the cart. When you say you loaded Jensen Ackles gun, what did you load it with? I loaded it with dummies. And where did you get those dummies from? They were on the cart. Did you take them out of a box or were they just laying there? They were in a cup holder at, at the top of the cart. Okay. Um, is that the only gun that you loaded dummies in that afternoon? Swens as well, Swen Temmels. Okay, so you go back to the truck, you get Swen's gun, and then do you come back up to the church? Yes. And where are you when you load that gun with dummies? I believe at the cart. At that point in time, if you recall, where was the cart? It was outside of the church, um, uh, several yards away. Okay. Um, so after the, you put the dummies in the gun and, and, and I'm sorry, did Ms. Gutierrez leave, walk away from the cart with Mr. Baldwin's gun? Yes. And who put the dummies in Mr. Baldwin's gun? Hannah. Did you happen to see or take note of where she took the, the dummies from to put in the gun? She says she was going to check it with Dave, so I assume the church. No, no, I mean when oh. she put the dummies in. Did oh. you see her? No. Okay, you don't know where she got those dummy rounds from? No. So then she says she's going to go in the church and check it with Dave. Is that right? Yes. And do you see Ms. Gutierrez again? No. When is the next time that you see her? After the incident. So the two revolvers that you loaded with dummies, Mr. Ackles' gun and the, the other gentleman, what happened to those revolvers? I believe I threw them away. No, no. What happened oh, to sorry. the revolvers? The revolvers? Uh, we took them back to the truck with the rest of them. I'm sorry. It's okay. I know. Have you ever testified before? No. Okay. I know. It's not the easiest of things. Um, you take the Ackles gun and... <laughs> I'm sorry. I just... I had to pause because I'm looking at bowls and I feel like he's totally zoned out right now, which is not what you want the, the, the potentially objecting attorney to be doing. Swin's gun and you put dummies in them, right? Mm-hmm. What do you do with the guns at uh, that moment? Sorry. That's okay. Um, I'll get you there. It's all right. Um, I took them to Dave to check, and then I gave them off to the actors. So you provided them to those actors, and then they were out of your hands? Yes. And did you touch any other guns or dummy ammunition prior to the incident? No, not that day. Right. Okay. Not that day. Thank you. Um, so after you hand those guns off to those actors, what do you do? What are you doing when the incident occurs? I am at the prop cart with Nicole prepping props for the next day, going over the preliminary uh, schedule. So you're at the prop cart and do you have any idea where Ms. Gutierrez is? No. What happens next? I hear the gunshot go off and Joel scream. When you heard the sound 
Um, what did it sound like to you? Did it sound like something that you were accustomed to hearing? No. Um, how did it sound compared to, you, you've heard blanks go off, right? Is that a yes? Yes. Um, that's okay. Uh, and how did this sound compared to, how did this compare to the sound of a blank? It was louder. After, how long after you heard that sound um, did you hear Mr. Sousa scream? Immediately. And did you have any idea what happened? No. What did you do when this ha ha happens? T tell us what happens next and how are you able to determine that something urgent is happening? Um, I was asking around what happened. I originally thought it was a special effects uh, rig that went off and they were telling me that it was a gun and I asked them whose gun it was and they said, well, Alex's gun is in the church. Um, and then I had walked over to Jensen. He was looking in the church and I could see Joel on the ground clutching his shoulder. What happened after that? Jensen told me to get the guns to safety. And so what guns did you take and where did you take them? I took Swen's, Jensen and Swen's guns back to the cart. Ugh. To the prop cart that was located right there. The Correct. cart. That's not safe. And did you do anything with the guns when you got them to the prop cart? I put them in their socks. Did you take the dummies out at that point in time? Yes. Um, why did you remove the dummies from the guns right there at that point in time? Because after they're not being in use, you completely empty them. Um, now, what I want to know is, is that the same prop cart that that the gun was unloaded by Hannah Gutierrez Reed? Because the dummy rounds that she unloaded could have mixed with the dummy rounds and the other rounds there were live rounds that were found with it could have could have mixed in together so I, i'm wondering if there were live rounds in the guns that she loaded too it there could be multiple prop carts i i just i, I need that clarified is it the same oh okay well so nomad purple saying there's only one prop cart so okay All right. Dummies are props that are reusable, correct? Correct. Um, so you removed the dummies from the guns, and what did you do with the gun with the dummy rounds after you removed them? I believe I threw them away. And why did you throw them away? In a state of shock and panic, I think it was a reactive decision. And yeah, not good that she threw them away. Did you tell anyone that you threw those dummy rounds away? No. Yikes. At some point in time, did you disclose that information to law enforcement? Yes. Okay. Um, my question is, were those dummy rounds later found? Because are we calling them dummy rounds just because she called them dummy rounds? Or have they been verified to be dummy rounds? Did someone end up finding them at some point and verifying that they were in fact dummy rounds? That's one of my questions. Um, so when you're dealing with these other two revolvers and taking the dummy rounds out of them and you said you threw them away, was there just a trash can right there? No, that's a few, way, a few feet away from the cart. That was where you threw them? Yes. Um, what do you do next and what's happening next? I don't know the order of events, but I know that I had called Seth Kenny. He didn't pick up my call and I texted him emergency and then he called me back. Why? Uh, sorry, just this is a point of clarification. Uh, Pule and Ivis, thanks so much for that. The corporal testified that they didn't even try and find them. 
as I didn't find out until weeks later. Okay, sorry about that. I missed that detail. Thank you for 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 clarifying that. So yeah, we're only calling those dummy rounds because that's what she called them. And we're just taking it on on faith that they were in fact dummy rounds. Ah. Okay. Why were you calling Mr. Kinney? I'm not sure why I did. He was kind of my mentor throughout this process. And I just called him. I told him what happened. And he was also freaking out. And that's all I remember. And what did you tell him happened at this point in time? Did, did it occur to you that someone had been shot? I didn't know Helena was hurt. I just knew Joel was. Um, so I told him that Joel was shot. And at this point in time, has it occurred to you that Mr. Souza was injured by a live round? That was my impression, but I didn't physically see his wound. Okay. Uh, because in your experience on movie sets, do dummies or blanks cause people to fall down and scream? No. So when you spoke to Mr. Kinney, did you, if you recall, uh, did you tell him any of the details about which gun it was or who loaded it or anything like that? Not that I recall. How long do you think that phone call lasted? 30 seconds, a minute. Okay. After that phone call, what did you do? Um, like I said, I don't know the order. Um, but I know at some point, uh, I had talked to Hannah. She was in the middle of a breakdown and she showed me the rounds in her hand. And she said, I swore I shook them and I could visually see that one of them didn't have the bullet anymore. Okay. And her statement to you was, I could swear I shook them or I swear I shook them. Okay. Yes. Um, and before I forget, I still have States Exhibit 163 on the uh, on the screen. Uh, do you know whose hand is in that picture? Who's holding the holster? It's Hannah. Um, so at any point in time, did you, well, after, and I understand you don't know the order of things, but after, if it did in fact happen after, you, Ms. Gutierrez shows you the rounds in her hand. Um, do you know, was Mr. Halls there at that time? Not next to me. At one point I saw him next to Hannah with the gun uh, by the church outside of it. Okay. Um, so what happens next? Um, after that, I go back to the cart and I start rattling dummies from a box. Um, and I notice that some of them don't rattle like they're supposed to. And did you tell anyone what, what you realized? Nicole was standing right there. Um, and she saw, and, um, and then I had told the police later down at base camp. You told them that, that some of the, um, the rounds didn't rattle. Okay. Um, and, and at some point later, did you mention to Ms. Gutierrez that you thought like more than half the box didn't rattle? Yes. Um, and it, do you think that more than half the box had live rounds in it? No. Why, why do you think, why, why did you make that statement to her? Originally when I was checking it, like I said, it was chaotic. I was in shock and I was frantically rattling the rounds. But as time went on, um, I realized that I had forgotten that some rounds might have had some, uh, a hole on the side of the, on the side of the rounds. So there were some dummies in there that weren't rattlers. Yes. Okay. They had the hole on the side. I didn't visually see it, but I noticed that there were a couple rounds in there with silver primers. Okay. 
you notice some silver primers. Correct. In, in your, to the best of your recollection, um, do you know how many silver primers you saw? Possibly two or three. Okay. And did you rattle those or try to rattle those? Yes. What happened after that? Um, I was on my way back with Nicole and Daniel, the art director, to take the um, guns back to the truck. And then I got a text message or phone call from Brian Norbell asking me to bring Hannah's personal bag to her. And so Nicole and Daniel continued to take the, um, the guns back to the truck while I did that. Who was taking the guns back to the truck? Nicole and Daniel, the art director. Daniel Ornitz. Correct. Okay. Uh, so you didn't take the guns back to the prop truck? No. Um, when you were looking in the, in the ammo, in the box of dummies, is that something that you just did on your own or did anyone instruct you to do that? I don't remember. Um, did you take anything off of that prop cart um, other than the dummy rounds that you've indicated you took out of those two revolvers? Did you take anything else and move it, move it back to the prop truck or anywhere else? No. Did you throw anything else away other than those dummy rounds? No. And Ms. Zachary, I have to ask you this. Did you bring live rounds onto that movie set? No. When the, when the box of Seth Kinney 45 long Colt dummies came on set on October 12th, um, do you know, did anyone inspect that box? No. Seth did. Uh, I don't trust that she would know if she brought live rounds onto the set. I don't, I, there's nothing that I've heard. Well, I should say this. The testimony that I've heard up to this point leads me to believe that she probably doesn't know the difference and that she didn't check the box. Okay. Seth Kinney checked the box. She's trusting his checking of that i you know that this this does this does kind of help the defense's um case on on you know seth kenny planting those on set because she could have been used as someone who's just ignorant enough to just pass it right through her that she's not going to do an extra check on it and you just you just kind of use she's just kind of like just transporting these things right on no problem um, did you see Ms. Gutierrez inspect that box after it arrived on set? No. Um, did, did Mr. Kenny ever instruct you or ask you to plant evidence or destroy evidence? No. Um, After the incident, after you pulled the rounds out of the box, um, what did you, what were you doing after that? Did you take a time out? What, what was happening? I went back down to the town. Police were telling everybody to um, leave the area. And I was having a panic attack in the town and Jensen and Swen came to console me and we were just talking about what happened and what might have happened. Okay. You visited with those gentlemen about it? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm going to shift gears here. We understand that you and Ms. Gutierrez were both doing some level of armor duties. Do you agree with that? Yes. 
and you and Ms. Gutierrez were both doing some level of prop duties. Is that right? Yes. Um, Which just sounds so stupid. Why not just have one person on one and one person on the other? I don't understand this whole like, oh, I do a little bit of yours. You do a little bit of mine. Like maybe they did it because of the scheduling or something like that, but it's just, I don't know, it's just, I mean, of course, for safety reasons, it's stupid, but also just logically to me, it just, it seems stupid. Did Ms. Gutierrez ever express concerns to you that she didn't have enough time to focus on her armorer duties because she was so busy doing prop work? I don't recall that being an issue. Um, did it seem to you as her coworker that she uh, was stretched too thin and didn't have enough time to do her armor duties? No. Let me just review my notes for a while. So data metal machine, she can still be charged, but she can't, none of this testimony can come in against her. If she's got immunity for her testimony, none of this can be used um, if, if she were to be charged. Do you recall there being um, a time during filming where there was a discussion about doing firearms training with the child actor. I do. And what was your understanding of whether or not that was permitted? Uh, production didn't want to allow it because of the actor's age. And if you recall, what was Ms. Gutierrez's response to that? Um, I know that she had wanted to uh, train the actor offset with the permission of his um, provider. His guardian? Yeah, guardian, yeah. Okay. Uh, so production had told her that she couldn't do it and she was going to do it um, with the guardian's permission. Is that correct? As far as I remember. Okay. Do you know whether or not that ever took place? I don't. Sorry, my earbud died. I'll pass the witness. All right, we're going to take our um, evening yep, um, break today. Thought. So now, so please don't talk among yourselves or anyone else about the evidence received here in court. There's a poll. Please do not look up anything about what the, are you guys uh, thinking? Movie production or this trial. Okay, don't do any research on your own. Thank you. All right. We'll see you at eight thirty tomorrow. Okay. So we've got a we've got a poll up there. Um, after this testimony, her, the, I'm not going to lie to you guys. I, I, I feel like Sarah Zachary's testimony helped Hannah. Um, I think the, the, the bit about her being tasked with, with like being the armor on set of another film because they couldn't find an armor for a couple days or three days or something like that, that really helps Hannah here because it's like, You've got someone who is a shrinking violet and is like being put in that role and and she's got like a couple hours of of training or a day of training or something like that. It it's it's yeah. It it also makes me feel like um Sarah's position is is you know that that uh, that phrase you know but for the grace of God there go I, like like Sarah, Sarah could totally have been a Hannah here if Hannah like I said this before if Hannah had walked off set, and and Russ Productions was like well we need someone that could have been Sarah and like holy cow can you imagine can you imagine like how that would have been 
Um, okay, let's get some some questions here while you guys are are uh, in, are uh, working on that poll. Um, bees. Uh, neither side has any reason to call him out on this, but can his testimony here be brought in during the Baldwin trial? If so, he has not been truthful here. Um, yet he's he's definitely going to be testifying in the Baldwin trial for sure. Um, absolutely, he is. I'm the armor. Sorry. Um, that was the the autoplay of the, the the video there. Uh, sorry about that noise. Okay. Um, yeah, his his he's going to testify in the Baldwin trial trial as well, one hundred percent. Pamela C. Um, I'm sure HG is hurting when she hears the accident being explained. I mean, there are parts of it that that I mean, she, it seems to me that she's trying to to not show expression, and sometimes that makes her look cold. Um. But there were some some moments here during David Hall's testimony where it did look like she did look genuinely sad to me. Um, it was still like subtle, like her 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 emotional range in the courtroom is is small, but it's uh, appropriately small is what I would say. Pamela C, are all plea deals the same? No. No, it's it's how how much does how much do th these prosecutors want your testimony um, to get the other guy? Uh, that's that's <laughs> that's often a a big part of the the uh, the measurement of a plea deal. Um, Jamie Bruce, bit behind. Sorry if I asked before, but during AB's trial, guessing DH will testify as that's part of his plea. Will the defense slash prosecution be able to refer back to his testimony in this trial? Once again, yeah, he he will be testifying again in that trial. Sai on, do you think if Hannah testifies, it will help her case? Ah, that is a that is a a big question, right? I I don't necessarily think that it's going to help her case. I mean. It could help if she's like showing remorse, but then again, the jury might discount her her showing remorse in the courtroom because they're like, "Well, of course, your 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 freedom's on the line. You're the defendant. Like, why didn't you show this before when you were just giving an interview to the police?" Um, and there are just so many ways that that it can it can hurt her case. So I still don't. I'm still not convinced that it's a good idea for her to testify. I feel like the damage is done in a lot of ways. And like I said, even more damaging information comes in um, about, about her past, about her history. So uh, yeah, I, I, I still don't think that it's necessarily worth it. Um, oh, sorry. I didn't mean to save this one. Not a question. Um, Jerry Roth, is it just me or does David Hall seem irritated that Hannah's on trial? I, I didn't get that impression. Um, I, 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 yeah, I didn't get that impression. Sarah, does the jury get to know the entire details of his plea deal? Well, they they did. They did end up learning about um, his six months of unsupervised uh, parole, and then you know the fact that he had to take a, a firearms safety class. Doctor Who eight six seven five three zero nine. So why give Sarah Zachary immunity for this mess? Uh, just to make sure that she's there to testify. I mean, there's there's so much that's been said about her. It would be kind of weird if she didn't testify. LK Ryden, why would the prosecution want her to talk about this? It seems super bad for them. I mean, there there are there are aspects of it that it it, it confirms what you know other people have testified about Hannah Gutierrez Reed, like not necessarily checking things properly or or you know. She never saw her shake any, excuse me, they never saw her shake any dummy rounds, for example. Like this is, this is something that's, it's helpful because the, the prop master would have been arguably in closer proximity to the armor than most people on set. So she has a, an ability to see more of her than other people might be. Miss Fitness 3, why does he add Reed and prosecution doesn't? You know, I don't know. What I've heard is that she goes by Hannah Gutierrez, not Hannah Gutierrez Reed. Um, so I don't know which one. I mean, I, I would I would have to assume that the that the version that her attorney is using is the one that that she prefers. I don't know. Okay. Debbie Faison Cook, Alita, would a defense attorney tell his client if things weren't going their way? Uh, 
if it's helpful. If it's helpful, I, I don't necessarily know that they would that they would because that's that's a very discouraging thing to hear in the middle of your trial, um, and and you also don't want to like send your client into the depths of despair halfway through um, because there's always a possibility that things might you know might get better. I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, Dave Beatty wants to know, sounds like a failure to investigate the scene to me. Could that have an effect on the jury? 100%. 100%. That, I mean, the fact that they did not test any of the live rounds that were found that the non spent casings, right? Not, the, the, the spent casings, I understand the reasoning for not testing those because, you know, the heat of the gun when it's fired, um, it's, it's just, it, it wipes away all of that information from it anyway. Like it kills all the DNA, right? Like you can't get anything good from that. But the regular live rounds themselves, that's, that seems to be a pretty big oversight to me in that investigation. And, and the thing is that like, if, if, if the jury is looking to the investigation and saying, you know, important questions need to be answered out of that investigation, that is a way for there to be reasonable doubt in this case. On the other hand, if the jury decides, look, regardless of where those rounds came from, regardless of um, even even like who loaded it, right? It's supposed to be the armor who loads it, but even regardless of who loaded it, um, you know, the the armor is supposed to check and double check and triple check and be redundant about it um, in all kinds of ways to make sure that they catch something like that. If the jury takes that perspective, then the investigation probably doesn't matter as much, especially because of the fact that she made a whole bunch of admissions on her own. Love bade me. It says, question, legalized, does this confusion sound like reasonable doubt? Well, that's that's the whole point that the defense wants to make here is that is that they they want to to throw up enough mud in the water so that the jury can't necessarily come to a a strong clean conclusion about her 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 guilt and if they can do that then that tends to represent reasonable doubt sorry guys excuse me Brittany Chanel uh is AB going to testify in this trial and when is his trial will you be streaming that trial too first question he is not going to be testifying in this trial because of the 5th amendment um, his trial is scheduled for July 9th is when they are picking a jury. 10th is when they have opening statements and it's up until the 19th. And yeah, you bet your bottom dollar. I'm going to be <laughs> streaming that one. Um, that one. I mean, yes, yes, absolutely. I, I think this, this whole case is fascinating and tragedy. Tra it's tragedy. It's tragic. Um, it's, it's the end of a day. <laughs> um, but I, I, I think that this, this case has been absolutely fascinating so far and there's, yeah, without a doubt, I will definitely be, be streaming that trial as well. Um, and by the way, the, the July trial date, that's what it's scheduled for right now. Things can happen. It can get shifted around or pushed back more, more specifically. Um, hopefully that doesn't happen and we get to see that in July. Um, are there other questions that I missed? Okay, let's see here. Um, there's also, um, Anna Lulu asked, sorry, I'm seeing it on, on the YouTube page and on the StreamYard page. Will the prosecution have Hannah testify in the Baldwin trial regardless of conviction or acquittal? Um, I would think so. I, I would think that they would serve her with, with a subpoena as well. All right, let me see other questions here. Ah, Pula Nivis, that's an interesting point. Her her le her name is legally Gutierrez, but she goes by Gutierrez Reed. Ah, okay. So there you go. Because, yeah, I know that Thel Reed is her stepdad, not her biological father. Okay. Also, the G slide. Oh, have you kept up with the Fannie Willis trial? If so, what are your thoughts? I have I have not been, honestly. Um I've I've seen some highlights here and there, uh, but I haven't I haven't spent enough time on it to really be able to give any really helpful thoughts on it. Um, Erica says she uses Reed for clout as an armorer due to stepdad's stepdad legal name is just Hannah Gutierrez. That's okay. 
Um, understandable. Mountain Princess 207, can you get out of a subpoena asking for the next time I get one? Uh, I mean, you generally can't just ignore one. Uh, that's gonna, that's gonna, that's gonna cause some, some trouble. Okay. Oh, Brittany Chanel, thanks so much for the reminder about the poll. Okay. Yeah. Let's, let's end it now. End of day six, which way are you leaning regarding involuntary manslaughter? 49% said guilty. 25% said not guilty. Too soon is 24%. So, so too soon, the people that are too soon, that's that percentage of people has been basically about the same. Um, but midday, we were saying 62% of, of, of the chat was saying guilty as opposed to 49%. So the last couple of witnesses were not very helpful for, for the prosecution, it seems. Um, wow. All right, guys. Okay. So that I think we'll do it for today. Um, all right. Thank you so guys, so much guys for, for joining me live recap, all of you guys. I appreciate every single one of you for joining me on this wild ride. Um, and thank you for folks in the chat and in comments for engaging in discussion on all this stuff. I'm loving all of the thoughts that people are, are putting forward together. Um, and just the, the overall vibe in the chat is just, it's just great. I love it. People, people agreeing and disagreeing and doing so in a way that's, uh, that's just helpful for getting to the truth with a capital T. Thanks of course, all as always to the mods for helping with that endeavor. Um, yeah, I think that for me about does it tomorrow is day seven. Can you believe it? Day seven. Um, that we will be back right here, 9 a.m. Mountain Time slash 11 a.m. East Coast Time. So I hope to see you guys tomorrow as we continue through this case. It looks like the the state is probably going to wrap up their case in chief relatively soonish. Um, so we'll see. We'll see. All right, guys. Thanks again for everything and hope to see you tomorrow.